and we should be on. Hello, everybody. Uh, let's make sure that it's actually working. And it says that we're live. Cool. So, uh, hello and welcome, everyone. We are here to talk about um, using YouTube videos in the classroom. Obviously, we are trying to make our videos uh, pertinent to uh, to educational usage. We are all history tubers here, but we're also all um, educators, as in um, either have or are uh, currently working as teachers, or in my case, as a uh, as a teaching assistant. Um, although uh, I'm teaching my own class as an instructor of record, so um, not the same as a professor. <laughs> it's, you know, lower rank doing the job of a professor. Um, so there's a lot of, of um, issues that come along with doing, uh, with having YouTube videos in the classroom, not only because of uh, how we make these videos and what platform they're on, but also just uh, you know, whether or not to use them. You know, is, is it uh, pedagogically correct to uh, distract from class by using a video and stuff like that. And that's what this uh, entire discussion will be about. So without further ado, um, also, uh, uh, obviously, I'm, I, uh, I'm Cypher here, and, um, but uh, you know, you'll also be hearing these guys uh, referring to me as Joe. Uh, but also, um, I am not only an instructor of record currently, having been teaching at the college level since uh, literally uh, spring of 2020, my first class got cut off, uh, got cut right into by uh, by uh, the coronavirus, and finally I'm back in person teaching for the first time since then. Wow. Um, yeah, it's been a crazy time to start teaching, <laughs> but that's also not the first time I have done any teaching. I was a substitute teacher back in uh, uh, 2013 to 2014, um, and uh, so I ha have also worked as a graduate assistant, meaning that you know I do grading, sometimes even have done some like guest lectures and that kind of thing. Um, and uh, study sessions and all that kind of stuff. Those who have been through college know that graduate assistants often end up kind of running the classroom behind the scenes. Uh, so uh, that's my experience. Let's move on to uh, Mr. Beat. Hey, uh, thanks for having me on here. Um, me and Cypher go pretty far back. We stumbled upon each other in the early years like of history youtubing yeah yeah so long man yeah, it's nine <laughs> years ago wow uh yeah. but and actually uh uh just met veritas who he'll he'll introduce himself here shortly but uh tim and i have also known each other for a long time uh so we've we've all been doing this for a while but yeah like my story usually goes is i when i started uh student teaching in 2009 um i was trying i was looking for ways to make uh, part of the American history curriculum more engaging for eighth graders. And it was challenging for things that, you know, like uh, how do I, I don't know, make the compromise of 1850 more engaging. And so that was kind of specifically the, the thing I searched on YouTube, which in 2009, YouTube was not even monetized yet. It was barely, I mean, it was mostly just viral videos and a few creators that posted regularly, but not many. And when I searched for Compromise of 1850, uh, all I got, literally, all I got in the search results were student-made projects of them kind of haplessly explaining <laughs> what the Compromise of 1850 was. So that was an aha moment for me, and I uh, promptly made my own crappy video about the Compromise of 1850, and I didn't publish anything to the public. It was just only for my students in the classroom, and uh flash forward ahead a few years yeah go is ahead that where, is that where the the song started yes <laughs> that's an inside joke ever since then i sing compromise of 1850 
Compromise of 1850. Everybody, okay. Uh, <laughs> that's an inside joke because it goes back to my very first video where I created that jingle as a way for them to just remember it is a, an important thing to remember in, in class. But anyway, so I, 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 I did teach for 12 years in the classroom. Something kind of weird happened in the, along the way, which we've all, you know, personally witnessed is that people were seeking uh, my videos just to watch for fun. Um, and so I had an audience outside of my classroom beginning probably 2015 or so. And um, it grew and over the years and um, it got to the point where during the pandemic, well, I guess we're still in it, but you know, the early days of the pandemic 2020, when you were stuck at home, we all were stuck at home. Um, I was, I had a little bit of extra time. And so I was making more videos and I got new momentum and, I realized I could make more money just doing that as opposed to teaching in the classroom, which is really sad, but that's what I do now is I recently left teaching after 12 years and uh, I taught in both middle school and high school um, in three different districts. And I've had, I've taught low income, high income, all ethnic backgrounds, like inner city to um, rich suburb to rural school. So and one thing that they all had in common is that they all were on YouTube for the most part. And I was like, they're there anyway. So this is where that was a big inspiration for me is like, I need to be be making videos for a platform a platform that they're already on. So that's where I am today. It's all, I still can't believe that, you know, I'm teaching. I'm still teaching. And I'm teaching more kids than ever but I'm not actually seeing them face to face anymore. So kind of crazy. <laughs> uh, let's move on to uh, uh, Veritas. Okay, so I'm an Australian and I've lived in Taiwan for the last 17 years. I teach literary analysis, typically AP literature and IB, that's International Baccalaureate Literature, typically to junior and senior high students from international schools, but sometimes from public schools as well. And I also teach English as a second language and English as a foreign language. And I've been teaching English here for on and off for the last 17 years, although my, my, my main career is a technical writer, which I, I still do part time, actually. And this year, I'll also be working as an associate lecturer at a local university teaching a photography unit as part of a media and journalism course, which I'm really excited about. And I'm thinking that that's going to be a role in which I'm going to be able to use YouTube videos more. And I'm really looking forward to that, having already given a, um, um, an initial lecture to the students that I'm going to be teaching. So something that I'm very passionate about when I'm teaching literature, of course, is helping my students understand the socio-cultural context of the text, without which the text is basically undecipherable, and helping them to understand the context in which the, the text was written so that they can understand important issues about history. And because I have a very free hand in the curriculum that I create, I'm allowed to create my own curriculum and then pretty much teach it the way I like, um, the company just kind of lets me loose because they know if I have the experience. I actually learned English literature as uh, part of my undergraduate degree. I did a class, double classics degree. So I did, you know, Greek and Roman art, architecture, history, language, studied Greek and Latin, and also studied European and British, British history from, or British history from about this, the Civil War to the uh, end of the 19th century. And English literature from Chaucer to again at the end of the 19th century as well. And I also studied a unit on a one year history unit all about nationalism, imperialism, and revolution, which covered a lot of the modern revolutions and, and nationalist movements. It covered a lot of it was actually this was back in the early 90s, and it was kind of in the early days of colonial studies and, and post colonial studies. And so as a result, it was actually quite a new unit in those days, kind of cutting edge really for the time. And that was my first introduction to post-colonial studies and I enjoyed it just tremendously. Uh, we were using original source documents and 
I was learning about this whole area of um, historical analysis, which I'd never experienced before. So studying, for example, India and Ireland, Kenya, South Africa, and Canada, the and New Zealand, the typical, the nationalist and the post-colonial and the settler colonial issues surrounding those. So that was something I was very interested in and remained very interested in ever since. And that's something that I bring to my literary analysis course, selecting various texts specifically so that I can introduce my students to these issues and give them a broader sense of world history, which is not very well taught in Taiwan. For example, the students here are taught virtually nothing about the Second World War, except from a very narrow Taiwanese perspective, which is very, very narrow because the Taiwanese, of course, were on the side of the Japanese at the time. Not by choice, they were a Japanese colony, but as a result, they have a very narrow perspective of World War II. And whereas, for example, you see, um, you know, military reenactors in Europe, uh, obviously reenacting, say, the the French and the British and the Russian armies in particular, in Taiwan, they tend to reenact the German armies and the Russian, you know, the, the, the Japanese Imperial Army. And not only that, but the reenactors of the Japanese Imperial Army typically come along with some fairly apologetic posters for the Japanese army, kind of like a bit of historical revisionism, insisting that Japan was fighting a defensive war against, you know, imperialist aggressors and whatnot. And there is, um, an, it's, an, uh, it's openly acknowledged that Taiwanese grasp of history in general, world history in general, is not very strong. And the, uh, the government's been, you know, talking about doing something about this for some time, but never really has. So, a lot of the time when I'm talking about issues like the Cold War, for example, even certain events in the Second World War, my students just don't know anything about it unless they've been to one of the international schools and picked up a little bit about it here and there. So I regard my job as a literature teacher, of course, as somebody who's opening their minds to a broader cross-section of the world. And of course, helping them to understand issues like settler colonization, which is very important in Taiwan, where, of course, there are Aboriginal people who are still oppressed under settler colonization. And on top of that, there are also Indigenous people. And obviously, I don't have time to go into it now, but as in a couple of other places, in Taiwan, there is a distinction made between Indigenous people and Aboriginal people. So the point is that there are se several layers of colonization and uh, several layers necessarily of uh, decolonization required in order to deal with Taiwan's past. Have it, have it been colonized by the Qing dynasty, of course, well, well, the Ming dynasty before that, the Qing dynasty after that, and then the Japanese after that, and then the Kuomintang, the nationalist army from China after that. And so even for the Taiwanese people themselves, democracy basically only emerged at the end of the 80s and the beginning of the the 90s. So it's a very, very young democracy. They didn't actually open foreign immigration until about halfway through the 90s. So that's a very big thing too. So they're still actually literally struggling with dealing with immigrants. And that's another issue that um, I discuss with my students a lot as well. So I see my literary studies as kind of a gateway into history and other social issues, socioeconomic issues in particular, which I think are of great relevance, not only for my students in terms of their understanding of world history and the world around them, but also their understanding of their own nation. All right. Uh, and uh, Tim, uh, let's, let's have you finish this uh, round off. Okay. I, uh, I'm Tim from Drona History. And how I got here is uh, I was actually in the Navy for about five years. And anybody with any military experience knows that you come from a culture of like, you have to train your replacement before you can advance. Um, so from that, because I'd never had a teaching bone in my body, I was more likely to get thrown out of class than to teach it. Um, but I kind of got an appreciation for teaching and like, you know, going around the world, seeing the world, wanting to learn more about the world. So when I got out, I immediately started uh, pursuing my degree in uh, when I uh, 
now have my master's in adolescent education, uh, secondary, uh, social studies. Um, so yeah, so I was doing that and, um, it was for, for a while I was doing, um, long-term replacement, leave replacement gigs in, in one school. And it was really good. I got to really teach. That's where I started. Like I'm making, I, I, I think Mr. I think Mr. Beat kind of started. It seems like he started the same way where you didn't first make videos. You started making PowerPoints that became more and more complex. And I started making PowerPoints where like everything just kind of ran on itself and it would play music and like they'd take forever to make, um, but they were really fun. But uh, at one point, um, like all the leave replacements had, had dried up. I was still I was still in school finishing up my master's. And that's just about when the Crash Course World History just started. And I was like, this is awesome. Like every Friday, I would wait for, for the new one to come out. I was really impressed by it. But I was also like, I think I could do something like this. Like I can't do it as well as this right now. But, you know, let me give it a shot. So that's how I started doing it. And just kind of, you know, slowly but surely. And that was on my old channel um, that I haven't, you know, that I've kind of left as a resource for teachers. Maybe we may talk about that later. Uh, but with my, uh, the older channel is more, I didn't even expect it to be, but more uh, accepted by like middle and even like, like uh, uh, primary education school kids um, and focusing like a lot on American history. And uh, I was definitely known for like my historical parody songs. But um, from that, yeah. So I've been working in education for about 10 years now, currently um, at a uh, private middle school uh, in New York City. Um, but I've done private school, I've done public school, I've done charter schools, I've done all kind of uh, uh, environments. And uh, yeah, now uh, it's interesting with the, what part of the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm focused on drawn a history is because of some of the differences between like educational based channels that are really geared towards the schools and like what that means for views and what that means for like, like actual community building as opposed to people that are lifelong learners. But uh, yeah, so that's the short on me or maybe long. Well, all of us have uh, a bit of a different relationship for, from, uh, you know, our teaching and our own videos. So for instance, for me, I've, I started the channel before I ever taught. Um, you know, I started before I even was a historian. It was originally called Cynical Cipher um, until I became a published historian, and then I felt comfortable with calling myself a historian. Uh, but uh, you know, I eventually ended up teaching, and I never actually used my videos in class besides uh those lectures that i've made uh, which are obviously geared towards uh using in a class um mostly because i uh, the first ones that i did uh was world war ii and cold war lectures and that was simply because that's right when the lockdown happened and i was like okay well i guess we're not going to have class for two weeks so uh, i'll um I'll do this so that they have something instead of uh, instead of us not being in class. And then it turned into two years of not being in class. Um, so I had to adapt with all that. But otherwise, my, my videos were never really, like, I, I never really intended them to be used in the classroom. I know that uh, they do get used in the classroom a lot. Um, but it, they're mostly about analytical history and, you know, continued learning in that. And while much of that does have uh, classroom applications, that wasn't like the original intent, at least for me. Um, and actually, the first time I used one of those videos in class was uh, was last semester um, when... <laughs> We uh, had, I was teaching like an intro to college class. I honestly really disliked that class because I didn't have any control over the uh, syllabus or anything along those lines. And uh, I thought that a lot of stuff that we were teaching was just a waste of time. And one of the weird things was, is that uh, I didn't have a choice in using my video. <laughs> 
it was just assigned to all the sections. <laughs> it was the history of Albuquerque video, um, and you know, just a thing for uh, for people coming to Albuquerque to learn about Albuquerque, and uh, and you know, that was the first time I've ever had a video that wasn't meant for a classroom actually used in my own classroom, and it wasn't by my choice. <laughs> um, but uh, I know that a lot of you have uh, made videos specifically for your classrooms, right? Uh, and do you actually, uh, when uh, or when you were teaching, Matt, um, do you uh, like in, uh, intend to use a lot of your videos just maybe you know, once a week, or is it something a very rare occasion? Maybe uh, once a semester, or well, uh, some schools don't have semesters anymore, I guess. But uh, you know, like once every few months. <laughs> uh, how often would you use your videos, and do you use other people's videos as well in the classroom? Yes, and yes, and, uh, too much. I use my own videos way too much. Uh, it's a bit cringy, but I did. I did make my own students who, who are a captive audience, you know, they have to be there. They have to watch me. And, uh, but you know, my rationale was I'm their teacher anyway, you're going to get it. And this way I don't have to keep repeating myself over and over as us teachers do. You know, we just, uh, I, yeah, this is my lesson that I would have given to you anyway. And now it's a video format. I can just click play and then I can pause if there's any questions. Um, and then later, of course, there were other, third-party websites where I could add questions to it. Uh, one of the bigger ones is Edpuzzle, which I think we've talked about before. Um, Edpuzzle is a pretty good resource for teachers. Um, it's kind of, it's problematic for, for creators, which we can get into, into that later possibly. But, but yeah, I, I played the heck out of my videos in my classroom. And I think the most important thing though, is like me doing that is I just have to make sure the students know that like, I'm not perfect. And then I get things wrong and I'm just one resource of very many resources out there available to you to find out what really happened. Um, so yeah. And a lot of times it was supplemental though, like, uh, and maybe, uh, Tim can chime in here because I know I've made parody songs too. And some of that stuff is really just like, it's meant to be for fun to kind of be like a bonus thing to help the students memorize something um, so that, you know, it would be something extra after the, they got the real lesson in class and then I'll hear something else. Like, oh, and then your other part of the question was uh, if I play other YouTubers, it's funny because one of the first vid YouTube videos I, uh, other than mine that I played for my students other than Crash Course was one of your videos, uh, Cypher. Um, I don't remember which one it was exactly, but I remember like showing it to them and like, yeah, this is a, Another history YouTuber I found. <laughs> so I remember you commenting on a thing that uh, you were going to use the uh, Philippine insurrection video. I think it was. Maybe that was the one. Yeah, because there was literally there's nothing about it. There wasn't anything in uh, our textbook about it. So I was like, I was just really impressed that you had even covered it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's. For a little bit in there, that was kind of my specialty was uh, American Small Wars, um, and then I switched to um, American Violence in the Southwest. Um, that's, but I still have a bit of a passion for American Small Wars. I just haven't made any videos for uh, it, although Indian Wars count. So that's, I, I mean, I put out a video on that just literally a couple uh, days ago. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, uh, what about uh, the rest of you guys in terms of using videos in the classroom uh, often? And do you use others? I'm teaching to like a middle school audience. So that's, yeah, using videos in the classroom. That's a fairly regular thing. If only because like the videos I wind up using, they're always like, five minutes or less. Um, and they're just introducing little topics or they're, they're, they're a way to really get them to get their head around the information so we can actually do something with it first. Um, 
Yeah, and I do use a lot of my older videos in there, and they get a they get a kick out of it. I can tell when they're starting to get like mature because then they start to get cringe on it. Um, because they are, you know, once once you get older, you're like, why why are we watching this? And then it gets double weird when I'm standing in the corner there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm standing, I, yeah, I'm standing in the corner there, and then my twin sister Kimothy is uh, singing about Texas, um, and you just gotta go. But I think it's uh, like I always kind of like that approach anyway, because it was a way to show them, like, hey, you know, don't be afraid to get excited about what we're learning about and be stupid and goofy about it, because it's supposed to be fun stuff anyway, or it's supposed to be interesting, and uh, uh, you're supposed to be enthusiastic about learning about it. Um, but yeah, I'll try, I'll try to use it, uh, uh, whenever I can, if only cause you know, I want to vary everything up. And I also want like, I have younger kids, so I want to meet them where they are and also show them that the, uh, uh internet can be used for good, <laughs> which uh, a lot of them don't realize, but, uh, yeah, so I'll use mine. Um, and then if we're just like, previewing a topic or we're just doing a short little segment I'll, I'll use i'll use others and then if we're ever doing like a research based uh, uh project that's when i'll definitely like i'll lead them into the direction of creators that i know are coming uh, that are reputable that are going to be leaving their sources like i know uh, uh cypher i've led some students towards you when they were doing their research projects um because like as a teacher, whenever you use a, a YouTube video, like there's always that I have to watch it ahead of time or else you're white knuckling all the way through because you're like, please, let's just get out of here without me getting any phone calls, without the creator throwing like a curveball in there for no reason. <laughs> um, so that's always that's always something there. But yeah, uh, I, I, I think it's great to use in the classroom as long as, you know, you're using it in the correct fashion. Uh, Veritas, got anything to add? Actually, I have a rather different relationship to YouTube in terms of my class because a lot of my students, as I mentioned, are senior high students, junior high, senior, senior high students, and I'm teaching them literary analysis. And although I sometimes recommend them to watch certain videos, which I tell them can provide them with useful information about the sociocultural background, in the classroom, I don't for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because as a literary analysis class, I'm supposed to be keeping them focused on the text and literally on their reading and writing skills. And secondly, also because, as I said, the, the kind of content that um, I want to introduce them to is made, has to be directly relevant to the text. I don't want it to be too diffused. And as junior and senior high students mainly, who are varying in their strength with their English skill. It's a little bit difficult to find good quality videos that I can recommend, which will be actually at their level, not just in terms of the English level, but obviously the cognitive content as well, the complexity of the, the concepts and the sophistication. So there are a number of channels I really like and history channels that I follow, which obviously I would recommend to a native English speaker, but which are much more difficult to recommend to, well, you know, a junior high student who's still kind of struggling to write a good essay and in, in, a, in their second language. So from that perspective, I, in my literary analysis class, I, I don't have so much of a, uh, um, uh, a use for it, definitely not in the classroom, although for my, uh, some of my better students who are better with English and maybe from international schools also have a, uh, maybe in, coming from an English speaking home as well. So they're better at English, and they also have a, a bit broader cognitive tool set. I might recommend a video or two and tell them, hey, this is useful background on this subject. This is related to what we're, this text that we're doing. You know, maybe it's Huckleberry Finn or something like that, or something about the Civil War, this kind of thing. I might recommend they have a look at this video or that. But actually, primarily, the relationship between YouTube and my classroom is that I find that my classroom generates content for my channel because in the process of this literary analysis of course i'm analyzing the text i'm gaining information about the historical context and i start pulling threads and i think wow you know i i've just done a lot of research here into this particular topic which could really be easily be a video and a few examples for ex uh would be 
my Cold War video, Cold War propaganda speeches. I have a couple of um, speeches from um, Kennedy, for example, his speech on going to the moon, his speech on the Bay of Pigs, and of course the Star Wars or Strategic Defense Initiative speech by Reagan. All of those analyses started as texts that I was teaching my students because I teach them a range of fiction and non-fiction literature and political propaganda is one of the genres that we analyze. I think that's particularly important to help give them a, a start on media literacy, which generally they don't know anything about, and understanding of political propaganda and even understanding, you know, and teach, telling them, hey, you know, your, your government does this too, okay? I mean, everybody does this and it's going to be useful for you to, to understand how your government does this. So um, I found that that the classes I taught on those three speeches were very useful in generating content for that video. And surprisingly, in the last year in particular, I have found that as I've been analyzing the English language textbooks that I use, there's a surprising amount of propaganda in those, especially in some of the uh, textbooks which are used in and are quite popular in Taiwan, either for teaching TOEFL or even IELTS, even some of the Cambridge material. There's a surprising amount of uh, propaganda. And when I say propaganda, that is what I mean. Some of the TOEFL materials produced in in America, which come over here to Taiwan and are readily found in the in the bookshelves, in the bookshelves, have, you know, little snippets reading passages on American history and, you know, describing Columbus as a unifying figure for the American people. You know, somebody that all immigrants in, in America and I identify with, you know, his his boldness of adventurous spirit and, you know, his, um, championing liberty and things like this really fairly outrageous stuff not to mention the article that i read which was um explaining that the civil war wasn't i mean was kind of about slavery but you know there was a it was mainly started by the by this um, dispute between the states over over uh you know state rights and federalism and this kind of thing and then i think probably one of the most offensive was the bizarre interpretation of Star Wars, which insisted that this was an allegory for the conflict between early colonists in North America and the native people and explained how Leia was um, a white European woman captured by an Indian chief and taken to his fort and he has to be, she has to be rescued by these European colonists. And this was just utterly bizarre to me. But I mean, this is the kind of stuff that you sometimes find in, in some of these textbooks. And n not only that, but I, I was particularly disturbed one, by one um, passage I found, a uh, listening passage actually, in a Cambridge textbook, and Cambridge IELTS textbook. And IELTS is you know one of the, the metrics that I teach. And it was a listening exercise where that as a student, you have to listen to a manager speaking to new staff. And the the uh, the manager is telling them basically telling them rules they're, they're new hires and they're telling them the rules and as I listen to it and think things they can't do and you know they're not allowed to take leave until this amount of time and then and they they not allowed to bring food and they're going to eat in these areas a whole bunch of rules about what they can and can't do I thought wow this sounds <laughs> sounds pretty strict actually sounds pretty unrealistic and some of the uh, comments particularly about the, about taking leave and and their probation time I thought that doesn't actually sound very right because I'm because they were talking about uh, staff who are in a part of an apprenticeship and being an Australian I know that the Australian apprenticeship system is based very strongly on the British one thanks to Queen Elizabeth and I actually went and looked up every single one of the rules and regulations mentioned by the, the company and I found that actually half of the advice and all the instructions that the manager was providing were literally illegal. It was talking about literally, literally you know, that the, the probation time was wrong. Um, they, they, he was telling them they couldn't take leave until this amount of time, and that's illegal under British law. And I was thinking, wow, this is actually quite outrageous. And it might sound kind of amusing at first, and you might think, well, you know, that's heck, it's just somebody in an English, you know, somebody in a, in a, in a, a, a corporate environment who's just making up an English text and, you know, just inventing stuff. Now, maybe that, that's true, but when you consider that there are an extremely large number of European migrants coming to England, 
particularly from Eastern Europe, particularly who do not have strong English. And when you consider as well that one of the biggest issues for uh, relating to migrant exploitation in England specifically, as well as Europe more generally, is lack of native English skill or na a lack of native skill in the native language, it's really important. I mean, if you're a worker and you're learn, literally learning IELTS doing this, learning this material, you could literally be learning things which are extremely detrimental to your understanding of your rights. And I think that's a, a really big issue. So these are issues I like to flag in the classroom. I mean, when I teach that particular passage in that particular book in the classroom, I, I make sure to tell my students, you know, this is illegal and you have to be, you know, analyzing all your stuff that, all the stuff that even, you know, English teaching material from a, with a very critical eye. So I actually made a video based on that as well, and I have some more content on that, which I'm going to be developing in my channel. So I find that actually, in my case, the classroom YouTube relationship is kind of the inverse to a lot of other people. I find that my classroom generates a lot of material for my channel. I expect that when I start teaching this photography course, that's going to change a bit because I'm going to be teaching college students who are much, much more aware and have a better co cognitive tool set and uh, they're going to be much better at English plus they are mainly international students so they're going to be from a range of different backgrounds and I'm going to be able to throw them a lot more videos and I'm looking forward to that because when I teach them in particular the part of my course which is about photojournalism which I regard as the iconography of history if you like I'm going to be teaching them about the role of photography and photojournalism in history and be able to show them some you know, videos showcasing iconic photographs and describing the relationship of photojournalism to the recording of history, in particular the relationship of photography itself to, you know, or in the service of the propagandist or the photojournalist or the historian, the activist, this kind of thing. And um, photography for photojournalism and social activism is actually part of the, the course that I've designed. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. I think I'm going to be able to use YouTube much more from that perspective as well because I am going to be teaching them a little bit about videography as well and composition and it's going to be actually quite useful to explain to them and give them some examples of of good YouTube videos which I think present information very clearly and with some good um, you know editing skill as well so that's basically I, I think how my relationship with YouTube is going to change from that perspective. And I think uh, as a good place to transition to like do we because i know i've been shifting myself in terms of how i make content in relationship with the classroom i've been for instance recording more of my lectures um and turning them into videos which um like for instance i did one recently on the on reconstruction and honestly i didn't expect it to to be as popular as it is and it's just slides like there's there's no movement no video editing it's just the slide for like five minutes then the next slide for the next five minutes and for some somehow that was actually fairly popular um and uh i actually meant it as just a thing because i teach that lecture in both halves of american history so it would be it's mostly out of laziness so that I don't have to give that same lecture over and over and over again. Yeah. <laughs> so I can just be like, and eh, watch the video. <laughs> you gotta save the voice. Uh, say again? You gotta save your voice. I mean, you know, we... Although in the first half, it's the last lecture. In the second half, it's the first lecture. Mm. Um, so, you know, that... Uh, it does make it easier since I have to do that lecture in a single day um, that uh, I could guarantee I could get through it in a single day because it's pre-recorded. I know the exact length of time, but I've also been thinking more and more about trying to uh, uh, use less analytical content um, and be, be more about uh, like, here is the history of X, you know, and that's not something I've ever really targeted until I started teaching and realizing that this is kind of necessary. Um, although it, it also, I, I use the channel to bounce 
ideas off of it, see how the public goes from that, and then modify my work or teaching um, accordingly and vice versa. Uh, for instance, the uh, video that I made that was on the lost cause was um, actually derived from a lecture I had made for a, uh, for a class, not my class, but it was a guest lecture. Um, and so I took the feedback from that because I had a, uh, I got some feedback from the professor and uh, somebody who was sitting in on it as well. Um, took that, made it into the, uh, made it into that video, um, you know, made the additions that I needed to according to, uh, to um, the feedback I had gotten. The video blew up, but I also got from that new things that I need to target in terms of um, misinformation that lost causers put out um, and being able to target that. And so I've made a few videos on that, but it also, um, but it also comes back and starts reflecting in my lectures as well. Um, so there's, it, there, it's this, uh, I don't know what to call it. It, the, it both influence one another. It's not, um, it's not that I'm specifically targeting, uh, trying to use it in the classroom, but at the same time, uh, I am changing, a, uh, stuff to fit a classroom context. And I saw earlier, um, Edu2, which is also, uh, who is also a history tuber who, uh, focuses on, uh, uh, like, uh, I think, K through uh, K through uh, just elementary school, um, I think is her main target audience. Um, so much younger audience than than um, we here focus on. But uh, she was pointing out uh, that uh, uh, Ed Puzzle, which um, Mr. Beat already uh, pointed out. Uh, has some issues with it, but we also, uh, but I know, um, Matt, you actually use, uh, well, used, <laughs> now that you're full-time, <laughs> it, Edpuzzle for your own videos. But one of the key problems mm. with Edpuzzle is that it doesn't actually, it has like a built-in ad blocker, so we get yeah. no, like, revenue from it, mm. and, um... Should we open that can of worms? <laughs> well... I think it's an important thing because uh, yeah. because this also changes the way we make content, right? Yeah, um, actually, it is probably pretty relevant to because, like, I mean, I can see both sides of it. Obviously, as educators, our primary purpose is to educate, like, to get as many people educated on the planet as possible. For, um, so, whatever obstacles that prevent that we remove them we strive to make it e as easy as possible for anybody to learn with with internet access um however there is a point where um the quality goes significantly down for content if there's not some kind of incentive and so the, one of the best parts about youtube as much as we all complain about it um but we all secretly love youtube and the reason why and actually hank green just released a video about this because he was comparing youtube uh, the way that it pays its creators to TikTok, which TikTok comparatively screws over its creators. But YouTube will give 50% of all its ad revenue to its creators, and it sees it as a, an investment. And the quality of content has steadily increased over the years since they started their ad revenue sharing program. And when you take that away, so just to kind of make it clear what, what actually happens with Edpuzzle, Edpuzzle, it allows teachers to find YouTube videos or videos from other platforms, and it allows them to alter it, add questions to it, make it more interactive, which is greatly beneficial for students because you can actually see whether or not they're understanding or not, and then go back and replay uh, sections, and you can, you know, in real time, you can even do it as a class, which I used to do um, so it is very beneficial, but every time you, every time a student or teacher plays a video for Medpuzzle in the classroom, it is not counted on YouTube. And when your views are not counted, 
With that, that has the views don't count. Even the views don't count. So it's more than just <laughs> ad, you're lo losing ad revenue. So you're losing the, algorithmic performance. Yeah, exactly, I didn't even know that. Exactly. And so uh, the only way you can get a, a view from Edpuzzle is if the uh, the student or teacher actually clicks on the video itself and then it opens up a new web page and then you, then it, then you actually would. But no. And so there have been several edutubers um, that have complained about it, and we've actually reached out to Edpuzzle and. Um, it's one of those deals where it would be very difficult for them to, it would, it would require too much, too much, um, too many resources for Edpuzzle to try to resolve this. So they just basically said, well, we just, our hands are tied. We can't do anything about it. And same with YouTube. <laughs> you, YouTube can't do anything about it either. So, uh, yeah, it's been frustrating to, to, cause especially, um, that's what, another reason why. I am not as motivated to make curriculum based content anymore. Like I just want to make cu curiosity based content because, you know, if I know it's, I mean, if it's going to be played in the classroom, there's a big chance that the views won't count. So, yeah. Yeah. And demonetization and, uh, and, you know, this kind of embedding, um, can, uh, can significantly affect how we, uh, what content we choose to make. Um, it's one of the things I noticed that uh, it, when we've tried to do collaborations on, say, uh, I remember Project Shoa, and um, that turned into a big fracas because uh, not only did they uh, demonetize it, they uh, age restricted uh, content about the Holocaust and even delisted it for a time, which really pissed me off uh to the point that my views just flatlined right and um like that i'm worried about doing any kind of coverage of genocide um especially if you're talking about 20th century genocide you kind of need to show the pictures um it it would be uh you know you need that shock value yeah. Um, and and to me, it was like, especially the age restriction thing says that you have to be 18 or older to watch, which means they don't want high schoolers to watch a video about the Holocaust. And <laughs> that worries me a great deal. So you have kind of this this two sided thing where you have this embedding problem from things like Edpuzzle. Full disclosure, I've never actually used it, so I, I don't really know anything about um, Edpuzzle. Um, but uh, we use uh, Blackboard. Um, and the uh, although they're switching to Canvas, apparently, um, but haven't forced us yet, so still using Blackboard. Um, <laughs> but the... Uh, the uh, um, that changes w what topics we choose. I'm, I'm never making another video about the Holocaust because of this. Like, I'm just not. Um, and that, that's pretty, uh, that's pretty bad for education. Um, that's also means that, uh, teachers get less videos to use in the classroom. Um, and something, especially like you know, something like the Holocaust, you know, some teachers might not might want somebody to do the difficult topic themselves, so that they don't have to. It, it's a nasty topic, and mm. but it should be taught. But some people, you know, are understandably hesitant to even talk about it, and this is a way that they can do so. Um, and. Like the first part of that Schindler's List video was intentionally made to be used in the classroom. Like I, I actually intended it that way. Um, and like now they can't. I don't know how Ed Pedestal will deal with age restriction or anything. Um, but uh, have you guys have uh, had this kind of you know demonetization will and that um, will shrink the topics that you're willing to talk about? 
Well, I've had, I've had, I mean, I've had, uh, there's a bunch of topics that I have on my list that I right now know I can't do them right now. Um, because I know if I do do them, they have a really big risk of getting demonetized or just not put out there by the al algorithm. And when I'm spending like two months in production on a, on an animated video, I got to do whatever I got to do to make sure that it's something that's actually going to get out there and grow the channel to, I till hopefully I can get it to a point where I can just go, yeah, I do whatever I want now, 100%. And the audience is always going to be there. Um, I just wanted to comment earlier. Uh, you're talking about the uh, about Ed Puzzle and and sites like that, um, and it just sites like that or, or like ad blockers. That's when I feel the two sides of me as a creator and an educator. Like I'm most at odds with each other because as as a creator, it's like okay, I'm working really really hard on this. I want to get you know I want and I want to get it out there, and I also want to get you know. Uh, uh, you know, whatever's supposed to be coming my way for that. But then as a teacher, I know I, as a teacher, it's like, these are all issues beyond the scope of a teacher. A teacher just wants to get the kids to learn. Mm -hmm. So um, like, I, I mean, I, I'll put ad blockers as soon as uh, I get a classroom computer, ad blocker goes right on there. Because if I want to show my kids a video about something, I don't want to have to sell them a Cadillac for 30 seconds mm -hmm. beforehand. Um, I won't want to get to the actual point and, and um, or as far as like Ed puzzle goes, I've used that puzzle before. Uh, I, I really like using it. It's a really, really good way to introduce new concepts, especially like independently as a homework assignment so that they can come in and ready to go. But I know that that's not going to count anything towards my views. But then again, I mean, if, if you're if you're making and this is part of what I saw with my old channel where like in summertime, I would shut down and I would plan the entire year to go along with like a like a, 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 a AP, a, a push schedule from somebody in the south. So it would pace along that. Um, but I know if they get show if, if the videos are shown in the classroom, that's 30 people seeing it one view. Um, and, and I, and, oh, like anybody, anybody who makes any videos that, uh, uh go, coincide with curriculum and are really going for the, in the classroom approach can, will tell you summertime is like death Valley for creators. <laughs> Anytime that, like, even if there's a three day weekend, your views just go in the tank whatsoever. So, uh, like people like Matt, people like you that, transitions over more towards curiosity based or just not linked up with like, what are they learning now? But like, what do I find interesting now? Um, you know, you kind of uh, uh, inspired me to go, you know what? I've done 200 plus videos that are meant to be seen in the classroom. Uh, now it's time to do kind of my own thing. But yeah, yeah. As an educator and a creator, uh, um, at times you do find yourself at odds with yourself. I got to give a shout out to um, Heimler from Heimler, Steve Heimler from Heimler History, uh, because he, him and I have talked about this very issue multiple times and he wants to branch out as well, like make more curiosity based stuff that he's interested in. Well, he's uh, got a separate channel for that now, right? Yeah. But even that he's having trouble launching it. Like people mm -hmm. know him as the guy that, you know, will help you pass uh, advanced placement social studies courses. And he's kind of stuck in that and it's hard for him to break free from that. Um, but I do like, yeah, in the summer, like you said, it, the views go away. And also, yeah, you brought up a good point, like 30 eyeballs on a, on one video in a classroom. Um, you know, you're missing out. I mean, think about it. You could have potentially 30 times the, the revenue um, if they were all individually watching it and so, you know, more and more teachers are doing flipped classrooms. They've been doing it for, I mean, a long time actually, but, uh, with the pandemic, especially with more and more students that can bring their iPads or, or, uh, laptops home and they can, they watch the videos at home. And then the next day come for discussion in class. Ideally, <laughs> you know, this doesn't always happen. So that, that, you know, it also the, that's kind of ideal too, because you want the, the student to learn at their own pace. They can speed up or slow down the video. They could pause and rewatch parts that they need. 
Um, but we just know that's not happening. Students aren't, they don't do homework and I don't blame them for not doing homework. I've, uh, my, uh, sorry. I, sorry. Oh, no, okay. go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, I'm in a slightly different position with my channel with regard to issues like monetization. In fact, this is one of the reasons why I deliberately do not monetize videos on my channel, particularly to get around that so that I just don't have to worry about that. I cover the topics that I think are important. And the issue you were describing with the Holocaust, and I remember when that all blew up and you were posting about it on your, on your channel, I was just absolutely astonished, actually. And for me, it was a particularly important issue because a few years ago in Taiwan, there was a senior high school which had a full-on Nazi parade, you know, uniforms and everything, flags, you know, simulated cardboard tanks, the lot, and people, you know, dressed up as Hitler and the members of the uh, the Nazi staff and that kind of, kind of thing. And there was a, a backlash from some aspects of the international community in Taiwan, particularly the American Institute, the Jewish community and some others. And it was very, uh, there was a counter backlash from the, from the uh, parents actually saying, we don't see what's the issue here, you know, that's none of our business, the Holocaust, we didn't do it. Hey, you know, we're on the Nazis were on our side anyway. So, you know, what, what's your problem? And it was around that time that, you know, government ministers and, uh, and academics were commenting on the lack of education in uh, the curriculum about really what this was all about. And, you know, the, the I know in the Anglosphere, a topic like the Holocaust for some people seems to be a topic just absolutely ex just exhausted by now. But I think it's really absolutely uh, important for people to realize that this is still a highly relevant topic, not just because of its connection to the, the Jewish people, because it's paradigmatic in so many ways of other genocides. And on that topic of genocide, I mean, if I was to monetize my channel, I would run into immediate problems. I covered Oriori genocide of New Zealand on my channel in one of my videos. I intend to cover the Rwanda genocide and a couple of other genocides in my channel in the future. And uh, I want to look at the, the, the uh, Bosnian conflict, for example. And Interestingly and enough, I actually my... have a video on the uh, on Hotel Rwanda and, uh, of course, oh, go, you into, do. Oh, oh, go into the Rwandan fantastic. genocide. And it's monetized. Oh, I really? Oh, like wow. I show bodies. That's so <laughs> random. It's so wow, random sometimes. That, how does that even work? Wow, that's yeah, astonishing. Also, monetization can significantly help you in the algorithm as well. Um, it tends to promote monetized videos. Yeah, and yeah. I have demo I have demonetized yeah. videos. So yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, my my entire channel is is demonetized. That's mainly from um, an ideological perspective. I have serious issues with. YouTube as a as a, a channel, and since this is basically a hobby that I you know I don't make um, my money from, um, then the lack of monetization is not a big deal to me. But one thing, yes, that I have been told by my my Discord community is, hey, you know, you do realize that demonetized uh, um, videos don't get promoted, uh, or certainly not as promoted as much, and that's something obviously which is a, is a concern. So I'm gonna have to think seriously about things like this and discuss it with my um, my viewership as well but yeah um i'm think it's bizarre that you can put up something on the rwandan genocide but oh, not it's... the holocaust well the weirdest thing is that originally the uh the schindler's list video was monetized and then when they age restricted it it remained monetized for a little bit and then they demon uh, they did what's called a sneak demonetization when i have an actual thing uh, email from them saying like this is approved for monetization and then mm. like they go back and manually change Uncheck it check it or something yeah oh, wow That's rude. <laughs> with no warning wow. whatsoever but yeah. by that point it was age restricted and delisted so it's like invisible you know, couldn't make yeah. any money off of it though the the thing on that um it brings up an important question is, uh, and, and this relates to showing it in the classroom and that is the idea of self-promotion is like, because essentially when you're playing your own videos to your students, uh, you know, even when they were made for the classroom and that like 
directly. Oh, and by the way, I actually just remembered one other instance that I used my videos in the classroom. I actually assign it my uh, hour long thing about the death of the Western um, in, uh, at, in my second half as just kind of a fun video for them to watch. Um, but that's, uh, that's mostly just a thing for them to watch. There's at that point, there's actually a lot of pop culture analysis in my class. Um, so it's a perfect segue from other stuff that I'd be like, I'm analyzing music in the classroom and that. Um, so actually the, the week before that, they literally just have a playlist of music to listen to as their, uh, primary sources. Um, but, uh, uh, are you worried about the this idea of uh, you know self-promoting and possibly making money off of your own students? You know, I I know that there's a lot of professors who who uh, sell their own books that they wrote. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, and yeah, they get the current edition as well. <laughs> yeah, and they have like a textbook that's like eighty bucks, and they require it of their students to buy. Wow. Yeah, I yep. know. I know some institutions specifically uh the entire uh california higher education system um actually disallows that um they, they ban it all together but obviously you it's know actually it, maybe it, not it, good for them <laughs> you're barely making any money off of advertisements but uh you know it, like for each view it's pennies um you know it's about the accumulation of views uh and of course, having it monetize boosts it in the algorithm and everything. But are you worried about that that aspect that um, that if you use your own videos, that you're kind of making money off of your students? Well, I gotta say, I uh, I, I mean, I've got my last two long term teaching positions because I make online video because. Um, uh, especially, you know, when I was uh, uh, years ago, I mean, I guess everybody's kind of like resigning now, but years ago, <laughs> uh, where I was, a position would come up and 300 people would go for it. So the idea that like I have on my resume, as well as all of these other things, hey, what is this like little channel when they check it out and they go, oh, okay, now I can put face to name. Like, I think it separates you from the pack anyway, from there. Um, but I mean, like we said, we're not really making anything off of inside the classroom. Now, if the if your students go home and they watch everything, you know, good on them. You know, that's their choice, and they're getting excited by history, and they're getting excited uh, uh, to like learn more, and that's cool. Um, now, I do. I one of the things you do have to worry about, though, uh, like I find particularly in my situation, you know, I have. Uh, uh, middle school girls and um any middle school students or, or adolescent students of any kind they're on social media all together so that's like the biggest thing and they'll come up and and they'll say hey are we allowed to like subscribe to you and i'll be like yes but do not ever <laughs> leave a comment i don't ever want to see <laughs> you leaving a comment whatsoever I actually and if, if they bring this up to me on Monday, I will completely deny that I said this. <laughs> but for the old channel, uh, for like the Mr. Betts class channel, I have a whole mythos of like, it's not me. I have four <gasps> twin brothers and two <laughs> twin sisters. I have my twin brothers are Jimothy, Himothy, Linothy, and Rex. <laughs> Rex went crazy because he used to be a math teacher, and that's enough to drive anybody insane. And then uh, for for the times where there's the female version of me singing, that's uh, Kimothy and Shimothy. So <laughs> it kind of like makes it like it makes it a joke, and then they get to say, hey, "Is Jimothy gonna be in our next class or something?" But like. It's enough to be like, okay, so we can acknowledge it, but not really get, you know, all caught up in it. But yeah, I mean, uh, as long as you're not telling them your homework is by my merch, I think you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have had to tell them, like, they're like, we're going to all come in with your merch. I'm like, no, you're not. I am not fielding those parent phone calls. Oh. That, like, oh, I'd be mortified if I heard it. that. Yeah, I'd be um, like, no, you're not. I will fail you if you all come in with my merch on. I mean, I, my, bro I mean my brother's merch on. <laughs> I had I had students that bought some of my merch and they came in and I was like, this is why did you do that? So I did. Yeah, that was awkward. And 
look, I'm not going to pretend like I, I, I shamelessly promote myself everywhere, like my entire life. Like uh, I've accidentally gotten good at marketing because I've been so shameless. And so <laughs> I don't care. But I think that it, the difference, though, maybe to kind of justify like playing your own videos in your classroom is like the true purpose. Um, you know, <laughs> I always joke around about this, but teachers don't do it for the money. We all know this. Uh, we do it because we're passionate about helping kids learn and building those relationships. And, um, you know, if if our true purpose is to get them to learn, then then a mission accomplished. However, you got to whatever you got to do to get them to learn that. And my mantra continues to be trick as many people into learning as possible. Um, you know, even if that means a provocative tweet, which I did earlier today, uh, and I deleted it because it was probably a little too provocative, but I'm just trying to get people to freaking learn, learn something, uh, you know, like, uh, so if that includes me dressing up as Hitler, which yes, that video exists. And I'm so, I, maybe I should take it down, but the kids loved it. And, and I didn't make money off of it because that was a Drake parody. And of course the record labels took all that money. So yeah, we're not making money from the kids anyway. It's, it, it's pennies at most. It, the reason why I'm able to do YouTube full time is because of all the people outside of the classroom that watch my stuff. The vast majority of my students in the classroom actually were not that impressed with it. They, they <laughs> like rarely subscribe. The the two that they actually bought merch, they were into social studies anyway, and they just and, and YouTube anyway. So they just thought it was cool that I was this popular, well, you know, D list YouTuber. Um, that was it. Like. Uh, you know, our, our viewers are ones who just love to, to learn anyway, and God bless them. They're wonderful people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think, um, th that one self-promotion is kind of necessary in this, uh, in, on YouTube, you know, you don't really have the, uh, especially when you have all these problems with demonetization, hate hate viewers and stuff like that um it's really hard to to make it i i know we see any number of uh of small history tubers begin and after you know 20 episodes that never never get a significant number of views they just call it quits and it's like i think it, I think I hit my first thousand in, uh, subscribers in like 2016. Um, wow. So, so I was, <laughs> yeah, I was doing it for like three years before I uh, even got to a thousand. Then literally the next year I uh, had my big viral video, uh, the 10 common slavery myths you, one. You and I would comment mm. on each other's videos and we'd be like one of the only comments on each other's videos. That's what I remember. <laughs> I remember, <laughs> yeah. I remember was the, the, the three of us, we had the S S history YouTubers. Yeah. That ran for like four oh, yeah. episodes. That's still up and nobody watched it. And it's, yeah, nobody still, <laughs> nobody still watches it. <laughs> yeah. I should link it. I'll link it in the comments. <laughs> I have a playlist where uh, it's like collaborations and mentions and all those vid videos are on there, <laughs> like right at the bottom of the list because it's the oldest. It's just arranged by um, newest to oldest. And uh, yeah, nobody goes to those. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, totally like those in the uh, comments because those were those were uh, kind of the first inklings of a history tuber community um yeah i gotta say like early people that got me into like hip hughes and tom ritchie like yeah hip hughes is is right up there with mr beat as like some of the nicest people i've ever met through this mr beat uh, i hate him he's the nicest person mm. i've ever met like <laughs> He will do anything for ever, anybody, but you know, like early, early educational YouTube, yeah, around like what 2012, 2013, you know, it was just a bunch of us maybe getting a couple hundred, hundred, uh, uh um, views, uh, uh, a video, and then just like plugging at it, and mm -hmm. it was nice. I, I remember I used to, uh, back in those days, I, I would, uh, wait to release a new video because you know i was under the assumption that like my newest video will 
uh, get people f who just find the channel and then click to the newest video. Um, that that was a uh, that was um, the uh, that uh, I would wait to release the next video until it had hit a hundred views. <laughs> like literally, that was the measure. It's like oh video hit 100 views next one it is successful <laughs> yeah this is how long we were doing it. i always wanted to to release a video and have it do well enough at the bat to get it to freeze at 301 and i uh none of my remember how all videos would freeze at 301 views yeah oh yeah and i would never get a video that would pop off like early enough for it to i was like oh maybe next time <laughs> <laughs> that and those days, those were very different days on YouTube. Um, but uh, uh, Tim, I know you need to uh, head out. Uh, no, no, no. That's at the end of the hour. Oh, end of the. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um. Oh. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> just the um, just coming in from <laughs> just um, coming from the from the perspective of someone who is fairly fairly new to the whole history YouTube um, community. I can really appreciate what you're saying because in those days I was a viewer. Obviously, I wasn't a creator. My channel was only basically a couple of years old, and I remember when pretty much the pretty much the only really really good uh, historical content that I could find on YouTube was basically reruns of old uh, BBC documentaries, or you know, um, some channel putting up chunks of World at War, right? The classic World War II documentary. Uh, World War One, the World War Two documentary, or um, the Battlefield series, and things like that, um, and there really wasn't a lot of commentary or analysis. I would say more particularly analysis, you know. And then even some of the early history stuff that I started seeing emerging, because I was always interested in history more than anything else, just was you know it's very rehashed pop history or you know, textbook, almost textbook reading, I guess. But there was very little actual analysis. And that's something, for example, when I, I first um, found your channel, Cypher, that really impressed me, just the depth of the analysis and the citation of sources and the transparency. That was something that really, really impressed me. And um, oh, thanks. I mean, your slavery video is actually not one of the first ones I find, found, ironically. Uh, but as somebody who didn't obviously grow up in the US and didn't learn a great deal of uh, U.S. history. I was particularly interested in things like the Civil War and the nuts and bolts of it and things like that, and a lot of the socio-cultural issues. I was always interested in it, largely from the perspective of how it interacted with my own literary studies. And I found that quite enlightening, particularly because I thought you were digging deep in the sources. And not only that, but you have explicitly have videos on your channel which explain methodology. And I thought that was just brilliant because I was taught formal methodology when I was doing my history unit, and even as an undergrad. We, I mean, it was very basic, obviously. It wasn't postgrad level, but we were taught how to read a primary source and how to read it critically and not take it at face value and compare it with other sources and taught the difference between primary, secondary, tertiary sources, analysis, and this kind of thing. And so that, that level of professionalism uh, really, really impressed me. And, um, Thank you. I actually got into it partly because I wanted to do things like the kind of content that you were doing, covering issues that weren't being covered. And I was getting really frustrated with, by that stage, what I saw as the dominance of a lot of pop history channels, which I won't name and shame, but there are a lot of channels out there which are, for want of a better word, fairly extra and are basically serving up rehashed pop history which is really weak on analysis or no analysis and you find it's just basically textbook stuff and it's not even very very accurate at all and then by the time you get to well uh the subreddit are bad history which is where i hang out a lot these days you find a lot of those channels getting absolutely shredded and for pretty good reason and one thing as well i was interested in was presenting historical analysis from a leftist perspective, I'm a Christian anarchist, so obviously I have a, a leftist perspective on that. And from my point of view, apart from the, the good work of you know the gentlemen such as yourself, I found that there was a lot of 
history, particularly the favorite history subjects, which I felt were being dominated by the right. Not, of course, in terms of analysis, but just outright propaganda. And I wanted to help correct that. So that was partly my motivation, and I was partly inspired by, I mean, your channel. Unfortunately, I have to say, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say, um, Mr. Beat, I didn't know about your channel until until relatively <laughs> recently. Actually, so, a lot yeah. of my early videos are pop history and curriculum based because that was... Oh, really? Wow. Well, because they were built for the classroom. And, oh, but, yeah. Well, of course. Yeah. But I will say that um, I never use textbooks in my class. Uh, you know, well, I shouldn't say that. Sh I shouldn't word it like that. I should say that they were just one of dozens right. of right. sources. Like, yeah, like... Uh, I brought up the Philippine uh, insurrection earlier that, um, yeah, that's not even in, that wasn't even in the American history textbook that my class had that was, I think it was 10 years, the textbook was 10 years old anyway. At the high school level? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, no, uh, but I think that one of my freedoms now is I, I can uh, make more analytical content um, now that I'm not in, like restricted to only making curriculum based stuff. And I think, you know, we want the kids to have the skills to for them to do the analysis so that they're the ones yeah. kind of leading. Yeah. But at the same time, you're right. It's important for because, you know, we all have our own biases and uh, mm. they understand that where we're coming from and how how we analyze this doesn't mean that we are uh, the end all be all. But um, it's something that could help the viewer um, and, and their journey to uh, evaluate all the information as well. So. Mm. Yeah, and speaking of um, you know malignant channels on on YouTube, <laughs> you can call um, them out. You don't don't be afraid, oh, Veritas. Prager, call them out. Prager, Prager you, you yeah. freaking <laughs> Epoch Times, all yeah. the people who show up on Prager you. Um, mm. These are malignant channels. They're not just mm. uh, they're not just uh, bad history. They're actively causing harm, um, and like. And this is one thing I wanted to talk about, about using this in the classroom. One, like, I know, uh, I've known teachers who actually used PragerU in the classroom, which is just like, you know, stop it. <laughs> oh, yeah. <Bad. laughs> well, it, they can use it, but how they use it, they just, they the students are not well, critically it, thinking about what they're watching. They're just yeah, spoon fed. You could it. use it as, as critical thinking in that, but this isn't that. Yeah, but also, yeah. um, one of the concerns I have about, uh, using like uh, even if you're just using it as an assigned homework thing that you know go watch this video in your free time um you know hopefully they are watching these things with the ad blocker off but there's a serious problem that comes with that i know for sure that prager you likes to advertise on my channel um mm. wow and you know i've uh, Funniest one is that I did a like reaction video to uh, a thing where they had uh, ac where they had covered my most viral video, <laughs> the topic of my most viral video, and actually did some of the myths that I call out. Um, and so I did just a quick reaction video on Twitch and then cut it up and threw it on here just as a quick way to get out some content. And guess who was the main advertising revenue on mm. that uh, video? So they're literally advertising themselves on a video that is about as critical as it can get of that content. And, um, you know, and I've, I've definitely seen um, revenue from Epoch Times, which is another one of these kind of propaganda mills. Mm -hmm. um, and how much does that concern you? And do you think that there's something you should do about, uh, you know, malignant advertisers well this is actually another reason why my channel isn't monetized and i'm just really struggling at the moment with this whole issue of monetization because i detest the fact that um you know this this exact same situation can happen and i know that youtube still can even with my videos completely demonetized YouTube can still run certain kinds of videos uh, of ads for itself on the channel. Or, for example, if I use, as I have sometimes, say, uh, a small clip from a news service, they'll run an ad and give some revenue to the news service. I think I don't have a problem with that. That's totally fine. But um, if I monetize my videos, that the idea of my videos being kind of 
ad hijacked for uh, a channel that I particularly dislike or that is even antithetical to my aims is a major concern to me. Um, so yeah, I'm at the moment very conflicted over the Faustian bargain of monetization. Um, I don't like the idea that if I turn on that switch, then I as well may be more inclined to produce content which will favor the monetization process and the revenue process. Um, I'd rather keep my independence from that. And at the same time, you know, as you've said, the algorithmic promotion system is what it is, and it's going to promote monetized uh, ads, uh, monetized videos more frequently anyway. So um, really just not at all sure what the best solution is there. Is it possible, I know I'm just throwing this out there because I just don't know, is it possible for you to make requests for certain kinds of ads not to be shown? Say if you want yes, to it is possible, but I think it's limited can. to four um, advertisers. Now to oh, me, I, I, I just find it freaking hilarious to be making money from uh, from PragerU. <laughs> well, yeah, like, I guess. At least, it's just, at least there's it's that like, perspective. They're paying me to attack yeah. them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, they should be the ones delisting me, not the other way around. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but I'm, the fact I, that you can only block four just speaks to the arbitrary nature of YouTube. <laughs> you can pick four. Why yeah. four? Also, yeah. the, uh, PragerU is not uh, when they advertise. They advertise through something like twelve different channels, so they're actually uh, oh, able wow. to block. Uh, you can block the main oh, one. I see. Right. But you can only block four of them, and yeah. then so it's kind of Hydra-like. Yeah. Yeah. And wow. there's just there's. It, uh, I find it impossible to even try. I I actually did block Epoch Times at one point because they were like Prager. You you can pretty much immediately tell it's it's a it's mm. really bad. But uh, the uh, Epoch Times portrays themselves as a news organization. Oh yeah, and but it's pretty clear. See, like somebody uh, shout out to Ross had, had a really good question. Like. Uh, on the topic of using YouTube videos as learning materials in class, how should you deal with some creators having an obvious agenda? It's like, I think it's a, an important distinction. Like it's not just bad history. Like we all have been guilty of making mistakes, um, including the crash course series actually that, and they've oh, been yeah. on that bad history. So I think we've all been on the bad uh, history subreddit at, at some point. <laughs> um, but I think agenda does matter. Um, and I think it is difficult sometimes to, to, to find a creator's agenda, but mm. you know, like with me, like what's my real agenda? Am I trying to start a revolution? Like, but I think, uh, my viewers like my longtime viewers, especially they, they know that I come in good faith that I come to, uh, I come first and foremost with curiosity and I'm just trying to figure it out. It doesn't mean I have the, all the answers and come along with me and let's try to figure this out. We're not going to get the absolute truth, but hopefully we can get, get mostly there. Um, and, and I'm not like I have beliefs. There's some things I'm very passionate about, uh, like as far as policies and and I have values like any other human out there. But I think the purpose of my channel is not to indoctrinate. Um, I'm just trying to educate. And does that mean I don't have uh, bias? Of course, I have bias. We all do. Of course, uh, we all have slants. We, we leave certain things out. Uh, we may focus more on one thing or over focus on one thing and, you know, brush over another important thing to someone else. But I think good faith is really important. And when you watch something like PragerU, there are obvious clues that they are mm. uh, trying to indoctrinate. And it's not mm. just about the videos themselves. It's about the what they're doing behind the scenes. Like they've been trying to get into classrooms for a while now, and they've been successful in certain districts as far as like supplying supplemental materials for students as they watch their videos. Like there was a story about these districts in Ohio that they were able to to do that with, and they're trying to do it all over the country. Like it it does crack me up. Like when you hear about parents that are all upset about these uh, liberal teachers or uh, even conservative teachers that are trying to indoctrinate their kids. But the fact is that you have private companies that 
profit. They have a clear profit. They make they will make money if their if their ideas spread, they will literally make money. That's that should be crystal clear for people if they're truly critically thinking about what they're consuming. Motivations matter. You've got if you're really looking at um, what they're doing behind the scenes, you'll see the motivations behind them. It it's not like I'm running a, a huge operation here. I'm in my basement. I'm by myself. You know, I'm not with the new world order. None of us are with the new world order. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I think that's the, the the biggest issue. That kind of transparency. Epoch Times, particularly, is just very nefarious in their presentation. There's a a lot of Epoch Times stuff floats over here to, to Taiwan. It has a fairly obvious bias, which appeals to a lot of people here quite, you know, under, for some understandable reasons. And, yeah, because they're um, ran by the Falun Gong. Um, yeah, e yeah, exactly, yeah. And the Falun Gong gets a pretty sympathetic ear here, mainly because... Well, you know, yeah. The, yeah, but the problem reasons. is yeah. Falun Gong are still kind of a cult. <laughs> and, oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean... They have... Uh, and, but, I mean, apart from the, the cult thing, that they, they just... they run about half a dozen channels and various you know media outlets and what you know the, the thing that is really nefarious about them is that they just don't tell you who they are right that they, they look like they've got these six or eight different organizations but they're all fallen gone you have to trace them all way all back back to the parent organization and anybody who's doing that i mean you can definitely definitely uh cite them for having an agenda um and <laughs> I think it's also Sorry, important ahead, here to to point out that having agenda, uh, having an agenda, having bias is not inherently wrong. Sure, um, sure. People people often resort. Uh, it's it's actually a well. Uh, it, it's a common term is the bias fallacy, which is mm, to right. say somebody's biased and therefore yeah uh, can't wrong. be trusted. Yeah. Um, and. Mm. That's that's absolute nonsense. That's not how logic works. It just means that their bias is different than your bias. That's why exactly. It's... Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that this bias is where I think that the key issue drive, uh, drive stuff. Um, yeah. and you know, it's more about what the agenda is and how much it affects mm -hmm. uh, the creator. And in the case of uh, in the case of uh, Prager U, um, it's just blatantly ultra conservative propaganda mm -hmm. if not reactionary um yeah, yeah. and uh, like prager himself is a paleocon so oh, that's yeah. that's uh well it's more specific than that it's um they they get a lot of oil money and mm -hmm. they they're i think the biggest thing that you'll see in most of their videos is um free markets are um, perfect like and mm -hmm. that uh, any anything we do to try to restrict markets is bad. Mm. Um, yeah. You see a lot of climate change videos, for example, like with PragerU, and like there's there's a reason for that. Like they, they and you yeah. also see a lot of culture war stuff. And the reason why is because that's that'll get a lot of clicks, and that's easy to kind of build up a tribe. Let's mm -hmm. Build up a tribe yeah. over here, yeah. then we can like indoctrinate them with the other stuff. So, so the issue yeah. with with uh, uh, going back to Ross's question is also uh, that um, it doesn't r really matter what the bias is. It's what the message is. Um, you know, the message of the videos is the problem. Um, and, you know, for like a PragerU video, it's, uh, you know, remove restrictions on oil. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. you know the the liberals are evil and you know the uh that anything to the left of hitler is uh you know going to send you to a gulag um this uh, that's the message and it's that message that that is inherently at issue um but this is also something that can creep into uh the classroom through using these videos simply because of these malignant ads right um and i think there's not really much of a solution there besides like blocking them ourselves or warning our students hey you might get these ads 
don't pay attention to them. Um, or I guess there's ad block, but I will never encourage ad block because, uh, mm. you know, that hurts the creator. Um, and really it comes down to, to searching for these videos ourselves as teachers um, and making sure of them, making sure they're good before using them in the classroom. Um, you know, I, I think the, uh, I think the the main issue with a lot of these is that some some teachers literally will just you know go to YouTube, search for whatever mm. their topic is, and just play the first video. Right. Uh, and that's just that's just a terrible approach. And I don't know. Uh, I I hope that I understand that, uh, why. I mean, te teaching is hard. We got yeah. we got a thousand yeah. things to do. We we need something quick. Okay, throw it on. The kids are acting up. Th put on it. You know. <laughs> Well, well, I'm sure glad that YouTube took away that dislike button for our, for people to start to get a little gauge on if it's a good video or not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's such a bad decision. Um, Actually, but, getting uh, back to what you're saying about that, like teaching the students to be critical, can I ask simply because I just have no clue, to what extent are, say, your high school students over there taught media literacy? Is that a is that a formal course? I mean, maybe Mr. Beat, your you, since you do social studies, I'm just guessing I, you might be in a position to know. I don't know. Yeah, I taught it to my students, and so any any social studies class, uh, mm. I generally taught like a, a mini unit on it at the beginning of the semester. Right. Yeah. Um, I also, I mean, the difference with kids like um, these days is that they've grown up with it, especially on the internet. So I think a lot of them actually kind of it's more innate. Um, all right okay yeah. it's easier yeah like they like i yeah. i find that the, the biggest challenge with media literacy today is with people my age and older like and oh, i realized right. like oh yeah we we did we were never taught this we were literally mm -hmm. never taught this so oh hey it's in for tiger star <laughs> um solution to prager you go uh, Go old fashioned and use and only use nineties VHS tapes. <laughs> only if the uh, TV cart. <laughs> only if the what the reel to reel projector is broken. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, raging I, ourselves. I think uh, uh, Matt was talking about something that that um, is interesting. The idea of like how you run your topics and how you run your approach different on your channel as opposed to how you would do it in the classroom um and like uh i not so much anymore but when i was doing the other channel more that was more like classroom based every now and then you get a video like i can't believe that you would say this you call yourself a teacher as to just blah 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 and it's like hey number one i didn't say anything wrong number two i'm doing this for free for you like i'm not making you watch this and you could tell it was it was somebody's mom because if it was a kid they would just say like a naughty word or tell me to drink bleach and i'd be fine like yeah they they identify themselves pretty quickly um <laughs> i actually had a student uh who left a series of comments um who hilariously uh you know i brought it up to my uh my grad advisor um and it's like uh this is an issue i don't know who this is i'm just gonna give him enough rope to hang himself and find out who he is and sure enough at, in one of his comments he complained that i gave him a, a and he gave the exact percentage of d i gave him and it wow. was like oh i know who you are now <laughs> and, and uh and funny thing is he actually got suspended for that um, and mind you, suspension in college is a big frickin' deal. Um, and uh, while it was only a week-long suspension, uh, it's it's kind of different from high school where it's just like you know you punched a kid and now you're you get to be a, a stay home for a week. <laughs> the uh, now uh, that's a uh, that means that he's on academic probation for the entirety of his. Uh, of the rest of his college career that's why um, again number one rule you are never allowed to comment on any of our videos <laughs> if we are your teacher don't ever comment yes that's that's uh, a good i actually should tell my start 
telling my students that that's a good way of putting it. And actually, I wanted to talk about comments um, because, you know, especially if, if I mean, if you're just showing it in the classroom, you don't really have to worry about comments unless it's a video like this where there's uh, I don't know why anybody would show this in the classroom, but <laughs> um, the the comments will be showing on the side um, on this. And also when, you know, I, I click on folks uh, and, you know, I can show here's <laughs> Noah's been trying to get on my Twitter feed as a uh, bad comment. <laughs> I might just do it. <laughs> but uh, anyways, the the uh, when you assign a, it as a uh, thing to go and watch um, on their free time, that means that they can easily scroll down and see the comments. And I know. Some of you guys don't bother, um, don't bother, like, don't mo moderate whatsoever. Just let it be free for all down there. Um, I moderate, um, but I can only moderate so much. You know, I've I've got other things to do with my life. <laughs> There's a lot of comments, uh, but uh, the uh, how do you counteract that, uh, especially if there can be some real nasty stuff down in those comments and stuff that will hinder the learning that they're trying that you're trying to encourage so what do you do about that i think this is to play devil's advocate this is one of the places where a third third party app uh, uh, platform like edpuzzle yeah. is one of the reasons why teachers enjoy that is because the only thing they'll ever see are the videos they don't deal with any of the com comments or anything like that i mean I don't know how Google hasn't with 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 it has Google Classroom and everything like that. How they haven't basically made the same thing and just kind of had some kind of educational fund to counteract that. But, you know, that would be helping the creators. Um, but, yeah, like you always got to just tell everybody just stay out of the comments altogether. Um, but, yeah, like the, when they're going off and they're looking at their at their own stuff. Yeah. It's it's really it's really hard sometimes because they'll say oh I saw this comment and I go oh yeah okay well, now we got to unpack this um, yeah so it is a challenge as a teacher but it can also be a learning experience too I don't think like uh, I had okay so I, I played I used to play my electoral college video to my students and it I, I give my opinion in it. Um, but in the video, I'm very clear. This is my opinion. So I first just give them the definition of it. And then uh, the rest of the video is my opinion. And I talk trash about it. The assignment always was the students were to um, uh, argue against me and say, basically, call me an idiot. I give them permission to call me an idiot. And you need to uh, change my mind, you know, like Stephen Crowder, change my mind that the Electoral College is actually good. Uh, and actually, over the years, um, some students made up some, they made us pretty good points. Like, and it made me kind of shift more towards their side um, or the other side, I guess. Um, the comment section of that video is a dumpster fire. I get a lot of horrible things said about me and students used to see it because they would seek it out because, you know, uh, they probably could have the intu intuition that, oh, he, he has an opinion video. I bet you there's going to be some people that disagree with him and talk trash. <laughs> Um, but honestly, I think by them reading those comments, they had a more well-rounded perspective overall. I mean, sure, there's some stuff that just is not productive at all, but some of it was, you know. So, I mean, yeah, we. I, I, I'm a very anti-censorship person. I think they need to be exposed to all of it. And the younger, the better. Call me a radical. I don't care. But like my daughters who are 10 and 7 they already know quite a bit and I think they're fine. No, no PTSD yet. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, and uh, by the way, all right, I'm not planning on anything like that. Uh, but uh, the, the issue I have is that I uh, normally want to try to encourage um, good discussion in those comments. And if they're just resorting to name calling, if they're saying falsehoods about history or the video and that, um, and basically if they're being a bigot, 
I, I'm fine with just banning them. You know, um, they they're not going to be productive um, part of the conversation. Then they don't deserve to be part of the conversation. Um, you know, that's how I run it. Um, so that I think for the most part, uh, my comment sections tend to be fairly productive. Uh, they tend to have uh, people who are either just commenting in support or sometimes just, you're biased, me. And it's like, whatever, bye. <laughs> but like the ones that actually start discussing, you know, the, the issues of the video the, uh, and, you know, it's not all in favor at all. Um, but the ones that are saying like, well, here's a bit more, you, you could have added more nuance to this thing. And then there's a conversation that happens with that. Um, that that's absolutely the goal I have with the comment section is that it actually um, is productive. Um, and, but that's obviously not something that all YouTubers want. Like Matt, you, uh, you just let it be a free for all. And, um, you know, uh, the uh, the idea that you know the uh, what is it you know the greatest ideas will rise to the top anyways. Just... Well, but also uh, you know society will see who these people are, and I think a lot of times, um, yeah, you get a lot of accounts that are just like trash accounts that they never they're very anonymous, and I get that. But at the same time, um, <laughs> I joke around. I'm only half joking about this, but my anti-Semitism video. Um, I leave the comment section open for the FBI, for the authorities to see, because you see people that potentially could be acting, uh, you know, acting out on hate crimes. Um, so I want their IP addresses, uh, recorded. Does that make me an authoritarian? No. Uh, in fact, I'm very critical of the FBI. I think, uh, <laughs> they've done some horrible things throughout history. Um, but at some point, you know, these people need to be exposed that um, they think they can just anonymously comment um, their hateful, you know, rhetoric. And um, I don't know, like they I, call them out and uh, it, it chase them down. And I don't know. I, I question myself every day. Like, I, <laughs> I'm like, maybe I should be censoring this stuff. Yeah, it's. It is a uh, it's a weird dance because uh, you know it also comments boost the algorithm right um, yeah and so so like while deleting them doesn't uh, I'm pretty sure deleting them doesn't actually do anything it if you ban them then they can never comment and therefore boost the algorithm so there's uh there's is a kind of you know it hurts itself in confusion meme in there um mm. but at the same time it depends on what you want to do with the uh with that comment section and i feel like this is something that uh is generally fine um for for most videos that uh one of the i do use youtube videos as um uh, as uh music you know just send them to a playlist a uh, youtube playlist uh in my uh, when i teach about the uh, counterculture and vietnam i send them to a, a playlist of uh, protest music and it kind of builds from there it's like 20 songs um and it's just all there and of course a bunch of those videos have comment sections that are uh mm. <laughs> and uh i think that in that case, at least, you don't have to worry about the comment sections because nobody cares, right? <laughs> None of my students are going to be like, I wonder what people have to say about CCRs, you know, run through the jungle. <laughs> it's just, you know, they, they're they skipping through and all that. So I think it also depends on what you're using these videos for. Um, Actually, the... Oh, sorry. Yeah, you are going to continue that thought? Oh, no. yeah. The most popular video on my channel is my What is Anarchism video, which I think, I think that's actually how I found you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it actually, yeah, it's spiked recently. I think it's got about 100, 100 coming up to 170,000 views now, which is massive for my channel. And uh, I not only cover several 
different anarchist systems, but I compare them with other political systems. And one of the political systems I contrast them with is fascism. And the most common comments I get on that video are about fascism. And they're either right wing libertarian types who are saying, they're trying to convince me that fascism is actually socialist and Hitler was a socialist and Mussolini was socialist and this is just another com form of communism or right wing fascists saying fascism isn't that bad. What are you complaining about? And this is pretty good. And I get the same comments so frequently that I have about three pre-saved comments covering the talking points that always come up and I just copy and paste. Generally speaking, these people come up with the, like, the same old arguments about, well, oh, Hitler said this, hey, they call themselves National Socialists, or Mussolini said this, and I already know what they're going to say, and I have citations and quotations from the literature and stuff like that. Or they say, you know, fascism, is, fascism isn't right-wing, it's left-wing. You know, the right-wing the right -wing libertarians say that. Um, or, the, you know, the, the pro-fascist people say something else. And then I have, yeah, th two or three comments. I just copy and paste reply. And generally, they just don't bother. A few people will try and go the rounds with me, three or four rounds of posting. And if they stop actually, you know, contributing, I'll say, look, please cite sources. If you don't, I'm not going to cite sources. It gets to the stage where I say, if you're not citing sources, I'm just removing your comment. Um, because I want that space to be properly informative. But one thing that it has done, actually, is looking at the number of comments that I get on that video is I have used that video to identify hot topics for future videos. And what oh, yeah. I'm now working on, literally one I'm working on, is the classic, were the Nazis or real socialists? I'm, I'm currently working on that video. I'm going to produce a five-minute version and then later on a kind of a serialized deep dive. Um, and I've got a couple of other uh, points of inspiration from the comments there. So that is one thing I have found interesting, finding out the hot topics that people do want to talk about and which are drawing a lot of attention. And definitely, you know, when you've got people who are moved to write you two pages of notes about why the fascists were left-wing socialists. No, it's um, mo then, mostly yeah. copy pasta, though. It's, it's copy yeah, pasta. Oh, it's, uh, absolutely. Oh, it basically there, there, is, there, yeah. There's chunks, chunks from the Ludwig von Mises Institute, you know, <laughs> chunks of articles from, you know, all these libertarian sites and i see the same quotations every time so i know exactly i even yeah. know the articles that they're it, going to now it also makes them pretty easy to identify like um now i will uh, i'll sh shut down a comment section if it becomes too unwieldy like that i can't even moderate it anymore there's just too much going on um but uh the uh the I kind of expected to do that on my Lost Cause video, which is my second most popular video. Um, and I haven't had to yet because they're just so easy. They're just the same comment over and yeah. over again. And it's just like <laughs> so easy to identify and eliminate. Repeat talking points. That's that's all they do. Repeat talking points. There's no original thought. Mm hmm. And uh, I often, I also like take screen caps of the stuff that I'm deleting, um, you know, that there's, uh, that I always try to, uh, I, I put them up on my server, actually, like this is, I'm completely transparent on this. <laughs> and um, and uh, those, uh, the only thing that I stop taking screen caps of is when it's become just so generic that. I don't need another example. I've got enough examples of just the random person going, it wasn't about slavery. Um, you know, what about this thing? What about that kind of thing? And it's like, I, I've, I've seen these comments a hundred times. Why am I going to take another screen cap of just another batch of the same? Um, but uh, to get back on, uh, on, you know, this in the classroom, um, I think the main thing is that, uh, you know, de uh, I definitely agree with you, Tim, that uh, I need to start saying, like, don't leave comments to my students. Uh, <laughs> I I never thought about that. But, yeah, that's that's a very good point. Um, but also 
that, uh, you know, they might go down there and that's something to just think about when you're, uh, when you're assigning it, not, but that's more as a teacher. Um, or you can find people, or you can find places that, uh, you know, block the comments or, uh, you know, know that certain comment sections are well moderated or things along those lines. Um, but also another issue with going down there is that there will be recommendations um, right next to those comments, that there are YouTube recommendations. And uh, sometimes, I mean, we have no, we have absolutely no control over that. Uh, I kind of wish I did because uh, there's a lot of times where I will be talking about like, um, you know, the, the party switch, for instance, and then it'll start mm -hmm recommending Steven Crowder, uh, who just did a video, um, you know, pushing a bunch of falsehoods, uh, as he always does. And of course that started getting recommended, um, from my political history videos. And I don't have any idea how to combat that. Um, you know, what if students go there and actually believe that idiot? Yeah, I think it's gotten better, uh, but it's still very bad. It's I mean, remember, what was it? Was it 2017 or 20? Uh, a few years ago when uh, there was a actually a growing flat earther movement and they there were some other YouTubers that actually explained how this could have happened and um Actually, there were engineers at YouTube that, you know, they looked for solutions to, you know, because of the, the way the algorithms were set up, it further insulated people into echo chambers. And so they would only see stuff they already agreed with and they just keep clicking on it and clicking on, oh, I agree with this, I agree with that. And because that's just how us human beings are. And they tried to fight it a little bit. I think the main thing that YouTube did in response was like, just uh, if you were openly like spreading misinformation and disinformation uh then you were targeted like there were there, there have been a lot of channels shut down especially with um misinformation regarding COVID 19 um i know and the vaccines um which you know like uh <laughs> that just further made people critical of youtube i guess because like oh they they don't want free speech yeah it's it's a weird thing because uh, I think the best thing that they've done in terms of combating misinformation, um, and, and well, disinformation is when it when they should be removing disinformation, at least according to their own policies. Uh, but uh, misinformation is a bit different because it's not intentional, yeah. um, and that. Uh, the thing that I've seen that they've uh, tried to combat that with is kind of genius is that they just put a little Wikipedia link at the yeah. bottom and mm. it's like, <laughs> you know, Hey, this person's claiming that the uh, election was stolen or whatever. And then it's just like, well, eh, this is disputed. Here's, here's some context. <laughs> just listen um, to the context. <laughs> when, it's always annoying when um, like, if you're watching a video, like, uh, like say you're watching, I don't know something by H bomber guy or Sean or something like that. And then they're in there or by Mr. Beat and they're debunking like one of these videos and like you go to watch the video in its original form. Um, so you can get the full picture of it. Cause you'll, um, you'll very soon see YouTube going, Hey, are you trying to radicalize yourself right now? Cause if you, if you are, th there's these over here, my, uh, my, you might like them as well. Um, and it's really interesting. Uh, Cause like, He's like, no, no, get them away. I just wanted to see like what it actually looked like in its real presentation. <laughs> um, but like recently I opened up uh, on a couple of different platforms, um, just, you know, different accounts for, you know, to grow the new channel. And it's amazing how quickly all of the algorithms on all of the platforms will make your echo chamber for you. We'll just be like, we're okay. We got, we know what we're going to feed you. And you're like, Whoa, slow your roll, buddy. Just cause I liked this over here. Don't push me off into the, into the uh, deep end, but like, it's all in their best interest to do so. Uh, yeah. uh, all the big companies. I, 
So it, it, would make, on that. it would make a really interesting video. Um, Matt, you go do it or something. It's like, let's build our own echo chambers and like see how quickly <laughs> we can build a super liberal I, echo chamber. I did that so, actually. Oh, you did? Uh, okay. Except for I tried to, uh, it wasn't about political things. My, I literally got it to, uh, to give me only cat videos. <laughs> <laughs> I I have a couple of other users, you know, for like my history class. I've made like uh accounts for the different characters I play. Um, you know, the crypto, the cynical straw man and uh and uh Cheka, the comrade Cheka, the cynical proletarian. Um, so my tanky and reactionary characters. And the uh the um uh, well we might get to that uh in just a bit uh but hold on while i'm talking about this uh but the um uh i think that the uh the algorithm does have that tendency by design um and that it is uh it it can be quite an issue with possibly sending your students down one of those click holes, right? Um, and by the way, I do think that Oversimplified is a great channel. And yeah, it, there's a, plenty of good channels out there, um, especially one, I mean, even some of the big ones are great. Um, but the uh, uh, that issue with uh, how easily you, uh, the, the way I did it on, on one of those channels, I think it was on the uh, Cheka channel, uh, was literally I just searched for it once. And uh, and I did this actually as an experiment. Um, and then just went through the recommendations. Um, every cat video went through. And it was like, it, and I kept on going back to the homepage to see what was going on on the homepage. And by about the fifth video, it was nothing but cat videos. Um, so, you know, I became a radical cat lady. <laughs> 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 um, but it, it is really easy through uh, recommendations, especially if you're signed in as a user to, to start going down that, that, deep dark abyss um and i don't know how do, uh, do you guys have a way of combating that media literacy oh, that's right yeah well yeah I was, <laughs> yeah exactly that that is actually one thing that um i've actually been looking at this recently because i'm planning to do a video on it because in leftist circles there's been a lot of discussion of, about this about i'd say um within the last year say maybe about 10 months or so ago quite a few leftist channels were bringing out videos on the outright pipeline so the mm -hmm. idea that you get gradually increasingly radicalized and there was a lot of a lot of videos i found a lot of videos at the time fairly shallow there wasn't a lot of analysis there was a lot of anecdotal evidence and oh, assumptions and so i was uh, kind of holding hold on i have to cut on. you off because oh, uh okay, go ahead. tim has oh, to get yep. going um and uh by the way, I, I don't think I actually said this already, but everybody's uh, channels are linked below. Um, and uh, so go and check them out if you uh, haven't, uh, but be sure to keep on watching this first. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, his channel is uh, Drawn of History. His old channel is uh, Mr. Bet's class. Um, but... Uh, Especially he's been doing a lot more animated history recently, and I'll actually be showing up in the uh, episode coming up. So be sure to check that out. Tim, do you have anything else you want to say before you leave? No, I just want to say thank you guys for uh, having me here. Good discussion for the past two hours. Uh, yeah, yeah, Cypher is going to be making a little cameo. He was nice enough to do a little cameo for me, so look for that in February. And uh, yeah, guys, enjoy the rest of the conversation. Thanks a lot. Right. Really Thanks for life. joining us. Yeah. Uh, yeah um so as you were saying about uh the pipeline thing. yeah yeah at the time that i was looking for some really substantial analysis and there were people even sort of you know at least a couple of people tried you know seeing how how far right they could push themselves from some clicks but there was a lot of anecdotal evidence and nothing really in a lot of depth but a lot of people were recycling the same kind of talking points so i held fire off on it myself and i wanted to see if this would actually 
emerge in any of the sociological literature. And after about six months or so in the last, you know, in the last actually six months, there started to emerge some fairly robust analysis. And the general idea was from some of these studies, and they were some of them were quite deep studies and analytical studies, was that it wasn't so much the, the algorithm that was doing it, but actually peers. The people you're communicating with in your peer group are much more influential. They're the ones making the recommendations that really matter. So I found that really interesting because I thought, well, if you're trying to do this from the YouTube end, then honestly, you're, uh, you're limited in what you can do because that's not really where most of the action is happening. So yeah, I'm not sure yet exactly what you can do at the YouTube end. And I'm hoping there's going to be some more literature on that, but I'm very interested to see how that's going to be developed because now that has been picked up in the literature. Now people are thinking, no, it didn't work the way people thought. The, it's not really the algorithm. It's peer groups. But there are very well-established networks among YouTube channels, but it's a result of something external to YouTube. So yeah, I'm still waiting to see if there's some more re robust research on that because I'm not sure what you can do as a channel creator at the YouTube end to combat that. Yeah, and uh, we'll get to uh, Matt's point on uh, on media literacy, which I think is actually really important, but I wanted to answer uh, Selenius, I think is how I'd say that, um, asking will... Um, the war on terror and that be remembered. I don't know how much of the actual war will be remembered, but 9-11 definitely. Um, just wanted to answer that. Um, but the uh, the meaty literacy part is uh, is really important to to say, but also m my issue with that is is that it puts a lot of impetus on the teacher. And Sometimes you just don't have time. Like I, I know I have no time in the classroom to teach uh, any kind of media literacy stuff because that's not what my, I'm teaching. Um, so if I send somebody accidentally through one of these uh, one of these click holes, um, the uh, I I don't really have the time to combat it. Um, and maybe. Uh, Something I would like to see is uh, Matt. You do some videos on that. I'm planning on it actually. I'm. It's, I've been planning it for a while. Uh, I, I might bump it up now, but I do think that K through 12, at least in the United States, I can't speak for other countries. So, uh, but I have seen the shift in my teach throughout my teaching career, um, where um, as much. Criticism as Common Core has gotten, it's mostly from people who are ignorant of what Common Core actually is. Common Core is the set of standards that um, states have adopted largely to, uh, you know, kind of make sure that kids are ready for college or uh, te technical school or whatever post high school um, plans are there uh, that they have. But they are largely skills based, skills based. And so content has been on the back burner in recent years. Like it's it hasn't, you know, that, that old trope of names and dates uh, for in a history class. Like that's just not how history teachers teach anymore. Um, unless you're doing advanced placement, which I saw Heimler in the chat earlier. Shout out to him. But I it, generally at like a. a a, your typical history class, the teacher is first and foremost trying to teach um, students how to act like historians, like how to research like historians. And so they go hand in hand with media literacy. Um, and and I, I think that we do have the time. We, I did have the time when I when I taught in the classroom to teach those things because it was like literally I built my lessons around them like, uh, OK, you're going to find out the truth. I'm not just going to spoon feed you the truth. You're the detective. Go in and figure out what really happened. Here's some primary sources. Here's some uh, secondary sources. Like uh, that's how I strongly believe that's how history should be taught. The students should be the ones who are leading the process, and you guide the teacher guides them. <clears throat> well, how oops, uh, how I do it is that I have um, lecture and then discussion. Um, you know, and uh, 
the whole idea is uh, my entire class is oriented around, um, and obviously this is an intro history class, upper division would be quite different, but um, the, uh, the main thing is that they read primary sources. That's, that's the only, the only time they actually read the textbook, which is completely online. I don't make them pay for a textbook whatever, whatsoever. It's called American YAWP. Y Y A W P. If you want to look it up, it's free. Yep. Um, and the uh, uh, I only use that as a recourse for people who miss class, so they miss the lecture and therefore need to read up on it. Um, obviously, they uh, they still need to get notes from somebody else in class, but the uh, the main thing is at least they have something if they if they missed class. Um, but I the main thing I test for is understanding historical significance. Mm. Um, I, that they actually have um, identification questions where they literally just have to identify the historical significance. And so that's what all the discussion is about, right? Is what that is. Um, now, I don't think I can really do media literacy stuff in that because uh, I'm more concerned about them being able to read something from the 17th century than... Uh, <laughs> And the then, assumption is by the time they're in college, they should have those media literacy skills. They should. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Uh, but I would definitely, uh, I saw um, Edu2 said uh, she has some media literacy videos and they are, uh, oh. yeah, and by far um, the least viewed. Oh. So, wow. so that is yeah. another thing where it's it's difficult to try to, uh, to do some of these topics because they just don't get the views to make it worthwhile um so that's um, very interesting because i mean i teach media literacy as part of my international baccalaureate literature course and which is i mean it's a very big component of that and i was actually thinking hey maybe i could use this material and transfer it and turn it into a small video series on med media literacy so I'm very interested to hear that. And I'm wondering if it's about presentation or just, I mean, uh, or people just not understanding or not seeing the utility. Because also, I've so also wanted to do videos on uh, it, historical it's because methodology. It's, a niche. it's probably because it's a niche. Uh, like when I've done videos on historical methodology, mm. those are always the least perfor uh, worst performing yeah. ones. I, I did this big one where it was uh, like I was doing YouTube shorts before making it. The shorts right. performed a Abysmally, except for the one about Karl Marx. Of course, of course, Marxism. <laughs> Literally the only one that that performed at all well. But um, then I just stopped doing the shorts because nobody was watching them, and so I put out the full video. And then yeah. it was like the worst performing video of 2021. Um, mm -hmm. So, like, even the live streams did better than that. So mm -hmm. that's uh, that's pretty bad. Uh, and even though I, I'm very proud of that video, um, mm. you know, I managed to shove an entire historiography class into like 20 something minutes. Um, yes, it's fast and it's it's mostly to refresh people who already know, um, but it's also real useful for exactly that. Um, but yeah, you're you'll definitely be hitting a real view problem. So mm. I have one last question for us to wrap everything up with but before we go is there, uh, anybody want to say something before we ask this like large this larger question i'm i'm good so the big question i want to ask is is youtube an educational platform um you know we've been talking about a lot of the problems with the the system, how it often is rigged against education, um, how uh, how much disinformation is on there and gets strangely promoted, um, and how it's the difficulties of what our uh, what teachers have to deal with, and what does that mean for? YouTube standing in the educational community. You want to go first? <laughs> well, as a simple, a simple answer to is YouTube an educational platform? I would say yes, in the broadest sense, absolutely. And I found it enormously helpful and useful myself. 
On the other hand, in terms of integrating it to the classroom, I think definitely there is a lot of way to go. I mean, considering all the things we've talked about, the various challenges, the various layers of just plain filtering that are necessary in order to try and separate the good content from the lower quality content and the content which is even just structured content just actually structured usefully for a classroom i mean um i know a couple of my videos have been shared in a classroom context by some of my viewers one of them introduced their teacher to one of my videos and they liked it so much they actually showed it to their classroom uh, when they were studying this history it was one of my little five minute videos and I was happy about that. I actually do deliberately make my, my videos with a couple of things in mind. One, every one of my videos has to be accessible to somebody who is only listening and not viewing the video. And secondly, I want it to be verifiable. And um, I always cite all my sources and for the references sources and things like that to make sure that it could be used in a classroom context and provide some useful information. But I think that if you're trying to use videos in the classroom, obviously, as we've discussed, there are a whole lot of issues with it. And the number of filters that you have to put into place in the selection process makes it very difficult. And I'm kind of wondering if a collaboration of channels could start a kind of a curated content list, like you know some of the playlists that, that you've made, Cypher, on various subjects, that you can say for teachers, for example, hey, I'm a historian or I'm a teacher and, you know, in conjunction with other teachers, I've looked through this and, and this is a curated list. This is the good stuff. Checks out. It's appropriate. It's age appropriate for this kind of level. It's good for this kind of grade. It has these sources in it. It's good. And you can use it for this kind of subject and maybe save them time, something like that. I mean, I'm just throwing it out there. What do you think? Well, I know that uh, there there have been efforts to there's like I think Ed Puzzle actually has like curated playlists. In yeah, that. I would expect yeah. a service like that to have something like that. Yeah. Yeah, but most of it relies on things like Crash Course, which you know ah. Crash Crash Course is absolutely useless in college. Like it's it's yeah. too simplistic. It has yeah, almost yeah, yeah. no absolutely. analytical value. Um, it is most it's actually not really made for high schoolers either it's really at a middle school level that they're teaching um in those videos and yet they're just kind of like the default because they're produced by pbs um and you know there's there's some institutional um biasing there as well of course um you know it's it's real hard to get noticed as a small creator but when you have pbs backing you suddenly mm -hmm. um Especially, it also was started by the Green Brothers, which they already have some heft on YouTube mm -hmm. as well. Um, I know I started my channel basically off of uh, having watched a bunch of SciShow. Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, one, but uh, the, I don't want to say what, what I think of this question uh, too quickly, but uh, yeah, there are efforts like that uh, to to um, make curated playlists. Uh, obviously, you know, I, I think teachers should think independently on that. Mm -hmm. You know, they shouldn't yeah. just take it at face value and yeah. they should watch all the videos before showing it in class. We also have communities building, um, which is going on. And, you know, this was advert this stream was advertised on our Slack. That's how, um, mm. you know, you came in We're all involved. and yeah that's right and the uh like that uh that uh it, it building a history tuber community um through things like we created you and the uh, history tuber slack are incredibly important and help us do these kinds of big collabs, but the, there's pitfalls with that too. I, I don't want to make it sound like, you know, every uh, everything ever produced by history tubers is great. Um, mm. uh, but yeah, uh, before I say my bit, uh, Matt, what do you think on the whole? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, just to put even a, uh, even more positive spin on YouTube, I'm 
obviously biased for it because that's how I now make the majority of my living. But I do think that um, it's a powerful tool. It continues to be in and out of the classroom. One caveat I might add is that there has, I mean, you guys know this, there's been a, a major shift around the world um, lately towards populism again, uh, which, you know, populism isn't all bad, but populism means that a growing percentage of the population doesn't tr trust the elites, whoever they are, right? The people that have power, the people, institutions, the, and sadly, in recent years, I've seen a growing distrust of the public school systems, well, particularly in the United States, but like we're like, oh, they're they're trying to indoctrinate our children, put, indoctrinate our children, push mm -hmm. a certain agenda. We've seen it with this this made up uh, critical race theory fiasco, which is it's pretty impressive how it was completely fabricated, but people bought it. Like smart people mm -hmm. actually bought it. But um, my point there is being that uh, I think we need to continue. Oh, we need to embrace, continue to embrace like uh, the decentralization of education, uh, meaning that if we teach the skills right, um, the we have enough young folks that are learning that they're going to be able to navigate through all this bad information. And um, that's my hope, at least, because none of us history YouTubers, social studies, edutubers as a whole pretend that we have all the answers. Um, the ones who pretend to have all the answers often are who we were talking about earlier who had the, the nefarious agendas. Um, so I think the, to, to think that we can all individually, of course, uh, educate everyone thoroughly enough, I think is a little too ambitious, but all of us collectively can, um, work together, but also call each other out. Like we, I think we are often too nice to each other um, because we're all kind of, we're colleagues, but we should mm -hmm. be like, you know, maybe that, that's, mm -hmm. yeah, that bad history uh, subreddit should maybe be like, uh, I mean, Stefan Milo is a great example. Shout out to him. He just released a video and he had to take it down because he had some bad information in it. And then he just, he, he scrapped it. And then he released a completely new video um, because enough historians were saying, Hey, you got some bad information here. And, um, I've taken down some of my old videos. Uh, I'm sure you guys have too. Um, mm -hmm. it's a process and, but, uh, I think we, we need to embrace it. It's not, it's messy, but I think it's a net positive, uh, YouTube. And I'm talking primar primarily like we need to, uh, I, it's, we've made big strides in the classroom, like, yeah, remember, YouTube used to be banned in most classrooms, like, until a few years ago. So uh, make it so that, it, hey, it's not gatekeepers that control the information. It's a bunch of people have all the information, and we're all learning this stuff together, okay? It's not like, oh, uh, they, want, they want you to think mm. that, that we need to fight that, you know, who is they? That's what we need, this idea that there's a they... And I know the real truth. We need to fight that right now more than anything. Yeah, and uh, especially my uh, one of my biggest concerns about using YouTube in the classroom is accidentally exposing them to disinformation. Um, you know, that's like PragerU is such a malignant influence on this platform. Um, the uh, but also. I, I think that it can't that YouTube itself cannot be labeled as an educational platform, but it does host educational videos. But because the platform has so many uh, so many mechanisms that promote disinformation, and uh, and um, that uh, demote information, <laughs> um, <laughs> that ultimately means that the that the system itself it, the the algorithm the way that they uh the way that they use demonetization and stuff like that until those things are favorable to educational creators and, and rather than being something that we all have to fight constantly um when 
we're not uh, when the worst things that we have to do deal with are just the trolls in the comments. Um, you know, the uh, up until that point, I don't think it, uh, YouTube can be labeled as an educational platform. It hosts educational content and can be a great good, um, but it ultimately it, it serves too much disinformation. Um, you know, you have a lot of people who, you know, they they actually let PragerU advertise. You know, that if they want to call themselves a uh, um, educational platform, they have to stop that immediately. Um, that is beyond what an educational platform would be allowed to would be allowed to call itself that. Um, if they were, if they're doing that, they are not an educational platform. Um, the, uh, they, the, uh, but I think they're, they are, have been making some headway, but I also think that we have to const, we, we just have to constantly fight. Um, you know, I did a video last year about the, uh, about how bad the demonetization thing had gotten. And then, mysteriously, I've only had one demonetized video since then. <laughs> it's gotten better. And I think it has been getting better, at least for bigger YouTubers. I I can't really say for smaller ones, though. We'll um, find out with Veritas, right? We'll see. If yeah, yeah. Can make right. words. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, but uh, I think a lot of the of what we've discussed is more that... Uh, the only way that teachers can use this is by fighting the system it, that they're using, right? Um, you, uh, having things like Edpuzzle, which distinctly harms the creators that they're using, but also is like one of the few ways to tend to get around a lot of these issues. Um, but, uh, you know, then you, uh, if you don't want to harm the creator of the thing that you're benefiting from, then you have to incur all of these other issues, bad comments, uh, you know, a system that's rigged against educational content, um, a, a, um, you know, the possibility of you know, that radicalization pipeline thing um, and, you know, nefarious ads, bad comments, these are all things that, uh, well, I don't think that uh, YouTube should really do too much about the bad comments. That's just, that's going to be there. <laughs> that's up to the creator to, to figure out, you know. Um, but the, uh, the uh, but those other things, especially, are things that YouTube could fix rather easily um, and just doesn't. Um, so... While I think it, I think it's important to, for uh, for us to continue adapting our content so that we can more easily serve um, educational purposes, um, while also still going deeper into uh, into uh, analysis, especially providing sources. That's one of the things that, like, I've I've been harping on this for. <laughs> nearly a decade and it's still a problem um you know the sheer amount of history tubers that don't include their sources mm. is infuriating um like you can't rely on somebody who doesn't cite their sources <laughs> it's just no um and uh even then you still have to be critical of of uh, what you're watching so while i think that there is hope there's still a lot of problems to work through. And it, these are things that uh, teachers should think about when they're using our videos or others. Um, so with all of that being said, do you guys have anything you want to say before we uh, call it a night? Is it night where you are? <laughs> it's almost. <laughs> It's, yeah, it's getting close. <laughs> I, 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 my just last thing, real quick. Uh, teachers, if you're watching this, please don't just show our videos and have no context whatsoever. Like, 
and that's it. Don't just leave us with our our video. Leave your don't just leave your kids with our videos. That's not enough. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, watch it before going to class <laughs> and using it. Don't just play the first video that comes up. Like, be critical. Um, you know, and take into account all of these issues that we've talked about. Uh. And maybe a word, well, yeah, I'd, I'd like to say for anybody who's thinking of doing a YouTube channel on history or who is currently a history YouTuber, uh, if you want to really up your game, I think you really have to think about what you're trying to do. If you want to do just pop history, that's fine. If you want to get serious about history, then, yeah, cite your sources. Please include timestamps in your video if it's more than 10 minutes long because it's just so infuriating when somebody throws up a... 90 minute video with no timestamps. Um, or at least that was only an option available. relatively recently though. So that's Yeah, yeah, that that's no, that's that's fair enough, yeah. Um but yeah, there's quite a few people who just don't seem to think that's that's very important, but at least or and I think also try and get yourself criticized. I mean, quite a lot of my my large videos, my deep dive videos, I typically when I release them, I typically release them as a post on our bad history at the same time as I release the video. And I do that for some kind of peer review and I get really good feedback and sometimes pushback. And I find that really useful. Sometimes I'm on a subject where I've done a lot of reading, but I feel like I'm still personally a little out of my depth and I'd like to make sure that I've got this right, especially if it's something on economics or something I'm a little weaker on. And I find that a really valuable process there's some very knowledgeable people there that i've got to know um on subjects particularly on those subjects i'm interested in as well and i think that's just part of imp improving yourself um i noticed you got on there very briefly actually uh cypher and wiped the floor with some very misplaced criticism of one of your videos which i was really impressed by and i was really glad to see you engaged there actually and very impressed of course to see you defend yourself so ably and i think a lot of oh, you know, you're talking about people... the uh, russian intervention one right mm -mm -mm. Yeah. oh yeah 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 i was thinking wow that i mean even when i was reading it, i thought i mean i'm not really familiar with this but it seems kind of thin and then you just came along and just went just swept the away <laughs> i thought yeah it was that, my yeah graduate it was my bachelor's capstone like don't uh, don't yeah. freaking come to this fight with a freaking corkscrew <laughs> when I've got a freaking gun. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it re it really did look like that. But I think that if some people you know who want to actively get out there and make a name for themselves or something like that, then yeah, prepare to be critiqued. Put yourself out there in the community. Ironically, one of the reasons why my channel actually started to get some notice was because I actually started posting on our bad history, and some people were saying, "Oh yeah." This, this guy's got something. Yeah, this this stuff's you know this stuff's worthwhile. I've had a few nominated posts, you know, for awards and things like that. So I yeah. find that really helpful. And even reading other people's criticism of other people's posts and videos and things like that, you kind of pick up on the things you should be looking out for, the pitfalls as a creator, as a, a historian. So I find that really really useful. Some kind of peer review process to keep you honest. And I know that if I'm I know that if I'm going to make a video that I'm later going to post to our bad history, it makes me pay a lot more attention to my presentation, my sources, and, you know, it keeps me honest and, and makes sure I'm not being too lazy in my production as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that the well, the idea of peer review, uh, I also actually really like having you know, comments who yeah. do that. But they could be peer, peer review. That's before, like a form of peer, peer review. The comments but also before the video comes out i will often actually send you know like uh especially if i'm kind of like this is a tough topic i don't know if mm -hmm. i should be uh if i'm handling it correctly i'll send it off to somebody to proofread um right you know the the last one that i had on that was the uh the black panther one um and sometimes that can actually help build a community because then mm -hmm. you know it's like since since he uh, peer reviewed it, it was like, well, I can promote your site, um, and you know that was that can help not only make you more honest, uh, but also build the community better, but build a historical community.
Um, and oftentimes I'll actually just send it to my parents. <laughs> <laughs> I've got, uh, I've kind of got to cheat on that because my dad's a historian and my mom's a wow. sociologist. So I, yeah. Oh, wow. Fantastic. You know, that's, uh, that's real easy. <laughs> yeah. Um, his dad's kind of famous. <laughs> true. <sighs> Annoyingly so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, uh, uh, he'll actually be showing, I just recorded um, my casino review, and I'm going to split that one up as well, um, where it's going to be about the mob in Las Vegas. And, uh, you know, he proofread that. Uh, he uh, Actually, I had two people helping with me with that. Uh, another historian named Mike Green. I'm fairly well insinuated in Las Vegas history. Um but like that can that can absolutely be really helpful. Uh, I know when I did my uh, police brutality video, that was something that I had four proofreaders. Um, so like that was one I wanted to be very sure. So my dad's conservative. He read through it. Mm. I uh, my uh, I have a friend who was very active in the uh, Black Lives Matter movement. So got his. I got it the sheriff of San Luis Obispo County that happens to be a family Ooh. friend wow. um, to read through it. So that got cop stuff and uh, mm. throw it to my mom as well. For, so that I get a more theoretical, get more theoretical heft. I play my parents off of each other because mm. mom has all the theory stuff and she's a professor and dad's like a local historian, but I mean, yes, he's famous, but like the, uh, but he's a local historian. So he's good at that kind of thing. Uh, and I think that would be, a, I remember we used to often send scripts to, like uh, Tristan and I used to send scripts to each other all the time to proofread. Um, so we can actually proofread each other as well. And it's important to be able to, to criticize each other. Uh, I know I sometimes will leave critical um, comments for other people. Um, you know, try to be respectful, of course, but, uh, you know, call out what needs to be called out mm. uh, and uh, be open to that criticism. Mm. So, yeah, I think these are all very important points. I know Matt needs to get going soon. Um, mm. And uh, do you want to add anything else? Yes, thanks for having me again. <laughs> yeah, it's always great. Um, so I think we've covered, uh, a great amount. Uh, we have, we've talked about, um, you know, we've talked about like what we do, um, and our connection to, uh, education. Um, we're all educators in this stream, including Tim, um, though he had to leave. Um, by the way, all the, uh, all of our channels are linked in the description. Well, obviously not mine, but <laughs> we're on my channel right now. <laughs> uh, I uh, who can. <laughs> oh, uh, Protect Stars talking about uh, my dad. Actually, he in the next uh, in the casino <laughs> review, he'll be uh, he'll be showing up. Um, <laughs> I re I really should record something like. Hold on, I got a friend that I can call. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but anyways, the the uh, that's it's a whole internet meme about my dad. Um, the uh, but uh, remember, all our stuff is in the description. Go and check out those channels if you haven't. Um, we talked about you know what are the pitfall, what we are doing to uh, create content for the educational space, but also doing stuff to, uh, to, um, you know, within the classroom that we're, uh, how we're using our own stuff and other history tuber stuff within the classroom. We've also talked about uh, some of the nasty parts of the platform, demonetization, nefarious ads, uh, terrible comments, all that kind of stuff. And um, finally, to wrap it all up, um, though we seem to actually kind of disagree on whether or not you can call YouTube a um, educational platform, I think we largely agree on its usage uh, by creators. 
uh, yeah. just not the terminology. And uh, this, we've hopefully offered a few ways of improving, um, both for YouTube itself and uh, our uh, our own work. You know, citing sources, getting getting uh, peer review. Uh, telling your students not to comment uh, or buy merch, um, and just a number of these kinds of things. I hope that's a pretty good summary of what we did on the stream. Yeah. If, do you guys have anything else to add? Nope. Shout out to Osbers Gaming, who's... <laughs> Sorry, that's a viewer. He's been <laughs> heavy in the chat. He has a good channel. I don't think I've ever gone to his channel. Um, so... Uh, yeah, I think this has been quite a productive conversation. I hope that uh, if that you guys will check out the, the other um, channels on here and have learned a bit about the pitfalls and uses of uh, YouTube in the classroom. Uh, otherwise, everyone have a uh, good night. Bye-bye. Thanks very much. I really enjoyyed Thank it. Thank you. I appreciate well. it.